Hey, everybody, welcome to the Jib Masters Show, live entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series. How are you and you and you and everybody doing today? Hope you're having a good day. If not, don't move an inch. We're going to make you feel good. We've got lots of music ahead, incredible conversation, and of course, our JMS Levity. What's the JMS Levity? Well, that is something very special and unique to this series, which we treat kind of like an old school television series, but with a modern vibe, modern twist of today, we call it the Jim Masters Show. So we bring in celebrities from Hollywood and television, music, film, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, inspiration, Broadway, everywhere. Some are celeb friends of mine I've worked with maybe over the years, maybe I've interviewed them on uh, television, uh, maybe PBS or elsewhere. Uh, some, of, some of them are brand new to our show and then they become friends of our show and we have them back. We keep the famous JMS porch light on for our guests and a lot of them want to come back. And then of course you have the ability to interact with us and with each other while the show is on live. Now, a lot of shows don't do that, but we do it here at the show, the Jim Master Show, because we want to bring you in and have you feel like you're a part of what we're doing here, part of this uh, Jim Master Show experience, kind of like the talk shows you see on TV and you hear on radio where there's a studio audience. So because you don't necessarily have a studio audience here in place at uh, Lovety Hall, as you guys call it. Uh, we have all of you around the world as part of our studio audience. So we are coming at you virtually, yes. However, you know, through digital form, uh, content creation, but you are our studio audience and you can comment when you subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is the one you're watching, watching right now. It's Jim Masters TV. Very easy breezy. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe to the channel. But when you do, you can actually comment right now in the JMS Lovety Hall chat room. Lovety is because I said the show has a lot of light, uh, a lot of light, love, and levity. Blah, 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 blah. A lot of light, love, and levity. And when I said that one time, I did what I just did. I stumbled on it. <laughs> and I came up with the word levity. And uh, our audience jumped on the word and they called me Mr. Levity. This is Lovety Hall. They're the Lovety Squad. And the guests are part of the Lovety family. So we levity that. And uh, again, Great music, great conversation. And we have a, a legendary, iconic person in the music industry, singer, songwriter extraordinaire, uh, iconic music producer, and so much more. He is responsible for a lot of music that uh, you have enjoyed over the years. I'm talking about Peter Bliss is in the house. Well, actually in his house, but <laughs> he's a name familiar to recording artists, labels, music publishers, songwriters, television producers. His songs and music have been heard on records and over the radio and television airwaves all over the world for years. The day after graduating from high school, he signed his first song publishing deal with Buddha music. He moved to Boston. Then he worked with folk artists like Reeve Little and Jonathan Edwards. His songs and vocals together with his guitar and keyboard ability led to the release of his self-titled debut album on United Artist Records. He continued to record and tour with artists like Tom Chapin. And yes, he's going to perform on the show for us exclusively, gang. Uh, the Jay Giles Band behind him, lead singer Peter Wolf, turned Peter Bliss I turned to him to help create the top 40 hit, I Need You Tonight from Lights Out, debut solo album. Peter's guitar and background vocals are featured on the album. Also, working closely with record producer Richard Perry in 1985, Peter Bliss, our special guest, helped guide Barbara Streisand through her vocal performance of his song, Emotion, which of course is an iconic, fantastic song by Streisand. That became the title track of her album. And with the song being released as a single, a dance 12 inch and a video co-starring who's Roger Daltrey the Who, from the who the melody and the lyric just became iconic. Now his melody and lyric writing is the common thread that joins a diverse universe of popular music again through the decades. His songs have been recorded by Menudo. Remember Menudo? And of course, Paula Abdul, Southside Johnny, Mr. Biggs, Eric Martin, Manfred Mann, singer Chris Thompson, The Osmonds, Annie Haslam of Renaissance fame, and international artists too from all around the world. Also, Tommy Nilsson and Louise Hofsey and so many others. 
Also in sync too, recorded a song for their home for Christmas CD, which uh, reached triple platinum status. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Peter's song Thick was awarded best rock song and second overall best song in the 2000 USA songwriting contest. He receives honorable mention and finalist awards in the Latin and children's song categories in the 2003 USA songwriting contest. His uh, catalog is represented by MCA Music, Warner Chappelle, Ronder, Pierce Southern Organization, and much more. His film work includes the movie Rise about L.A. street dancing and the soundtrack in the film Bloodlines. Television work includes the theme for the twisted tales of Felix the Cat, the morning show originally seen on CBS. That's right. The morning show on CBS and currently being shown around the world. Reality TV's High School Reunion, MTV's The Real Life. He created the themes for these. Uh, also, ABC's All My Children has featured his songs. Corporate work is extraordinary as well, and it's it's on and on. He's got an incredible interest in educational fields as well. That has uh, been really, really terrific because he's lent his uh, talents to the Children's Television Workshop. Of course, they're the creators of Sesame Street. He worked on Square One the TV series, writing and producing songs for music videos by artists like The Judds and Bobby McFerrin, Side by Side and Word by Word and companion music albums and songs, the song books written and produced by Pearson Books. Yeah, it's really incredible. His love for the craft of songwriting led to him becoming the professional activities coordinator for the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Continuing through 2011, he's established workshops, events, showcase programs. He's helped bring the vast talent of New York City songwriters and business professionals together. And events like Words About Music uh, are very, very popular. Also, there's a master class, too. Uh, it's just incredible. And this is just the short list, folks. We're just really touching upon the short list of what this iconic singer, songwriter, and uh music producer extraordinaire has done and continues to do. And we are so uh, honored to have him here. He's a performer himself. He has a ball. And, and as I mentioned, he has worked with some of the most iconic people of our time, including Dan Hartman. Remember Dan Hartman, of course, I can dream about you and all those great songs. And uh, of course, uh, there's Don Convey and so many others, Andy Frazier of Free, as I mentioned, in Sync, Paula Abdul. This is just the short list of people he's worked with and on their music. Barbara Streisand, Menudo, The Osmonds, Eric Martin, you name it, uh, he's more than likely been involved in it. And that's incredible. So we've got somebody quite special here on our show, gang. He's touched on all these genres of music, and it's really, really cool. If you want to comment during the show, all you have to do is subscribe to the YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV right now. It doesn't cost anything. And you can comment during the show. Don't forget to give us a like, drop a comment in the comment section, and subscribe to the channel and all that jazz. Now that we took care of all that, let's welcome our guest to the Gym Masters Show Live. He is positioned in front of his microphone, and he's got his acoustic all ready to go. Let's welcome Peter Bliss coming to the Gym Masters Show for a blissful time of levity. Welcome, my friend. Jim. <laughs> I'm exhausted. I'm tired. What is <laughs> left to say after that? There's absolutely nothing Holy left to say. Cow. I My mean, God. we can go into some of the details of some of that if you'd like. But uh, yes, why have you always been such a slacker? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. But uh, I so truly nice. do love. I truly love. You know, those twelve notes, and. Um, Yes, you know they were somehow the way to keep my overactive, hyperactive self from you know being thrown out of the house at an early age. <laughs> uh, and somehow, when you know my parents gave me a guitar, or mm. my next door neighbor to my next door neighbor, at the age of seven, and I disappeared into my room and it got quiet, and they all were worried that I might have run away from home, <laughs> or done something. So. Um, I, all I can say is I've been very, very fortunate to be able to do what I love to do all these years. That really is what it comes down to. 
Uh, so yeah. is that what happened initially when you were a kid? Uh, the guitar came your way and then you just fell in love with it, started taking lessons and everything blossomed from, from there? Well, you know, I, I family of three, three boys. I was the middle. Um, and, and still some, are. Yeah, I still <laughs> have. Thankfully, yes, and we're all still here. Um, but... It, it, it came in an interesting way. We, I grew up in Yonkers, New York, and our next door neighbors were, um, yeah. you know, they had just come over from Italy yeah. and they came over and, and they were all musicians. So every Saturday night, they would sit outside their house, which was right adjacent to ours, and I would stand on the corrugated fence between our properties and they would sit and play old Italian songs on the most valuable Vega banjos, um, Gibson Mando cellos and guitars and Martin guitars. Oh, and yeah. they would sing and play. Wow. And I was, I think, six or seven. And my mom would, you know, and dad would see me there. And Uncle Joe, our next door neighbor, came over and said, you want to come over? <laughs> you want to come over and sit with us? Yeah. And so my mom and dad, and so every week, and they would come and play and I would sit and listen and watch. Yeah. Um, Uncle Joe had a son named Little Joe. <laughs> of course, yes. What else? Yes, and not Joey, was, but Little Joe. Yeah. Yes, so Little Joe gave me two guitar lessons. And um, I think, and this this actually does have some import to a, a, later, uh, a later comment, but um, the Mel Bay book, book one, the blue book, that every guitar player has probably come across in their travels. The very first exercises where you're just doing exercises up the strings. Yeah. Um, I, my parents got, well, back then, I think it was more like a string instead of a phone call, you know, and a paper cup. Right. They, they said, Peter's not reading the music. He's playing it by ear. Mm, um, wow. Because yeah. I would ask them to play it first and then I would mimic it. Mm -hmm. So um, to this day, I mean, I have to be honest with you, I I went to college for one year mm -hmm. and I um, wear it as a badge of pride that I kind of flunked music theory. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I know, I know. Um, but uh, I never had the patience to do all of those, that study, and I just yeah. wanted to make the music. Yeah, so, you feel it. Yeah, you, yeah. Have, you can yeah. feel the music. And yeah. if you look behind me, Yes. Um, that guitar that's next to the speaker on the top, that is the guitar that Uncle Joe got me. Uh, so that it's it's still it's still there. Um, there's tissue paper on the strings because the strings don't you know couldn't everything. It was a piece of wood that was basically falling apart. Um, but I still have it. It's a wonderful memento to have of all this time. Well, is that, huh? Yeah, that is good. very special. And Not, I, uh, I also want you to know, Jim, I'm incredibly impressed that you can zoom in my apartment and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> I have the power. My name, my name is Masters. I'm the master. Oh, there you go. But Boom. Um, I know. But anyway, the thing is, is that is I that can, your studio where you are? The the room you're in is that like the that's home where studio? I yeah, that's my home studio. Yeah, that's where I yeah I do most of my work. And you know, as all of us have had to do, you know, I'm not exactly sure when your show started, but um, songwriters trying to get into a room together, which was half the fun, we had to figure out a way to continue writing during the pandemic and not. Um, jeopardize everybody's health so right exactly. you know zoom you know and has that. become an essential part of i, I tell you and everything the, the last time that we heard the use of the word zoom yeah was either mazda zoom zoom yeah, yeah or yeah. on pbs we're gonna zoom a zoom right. a zoom a zoom right boston mass oh two one three right. four the kids used to sing that at the end the zoom tv kids series and now yeah that the people use zoom for conferences and all the different things that they do uh we started this at the end of march early april of 2020 we're coming up on just shy well 
a couple of weeks. It'll be three years yes, and yes. over 900 episodes in just three years. That's amazing. That's great. We had I hope Loretta. I don't. I hope, <laughs> I hope I don't close the show for you because I actually, I actually wrote the theme song for a local New York show called the DJ Cat Show. Oh yeah, and sure. Um, they said, well, you wrote the new theme song. We have to introduce it, so we want you to go on the show with the puppet. <laughs> Two weeks later, the show got canceled. So I hope I don't. I'm oh no, no, you. no! You you know why this show will not be with you on it? Don't no worries, my friend. You know All why? Right. You know why? Because he's not a puppet. He's a collectible doll. But yeah. George Burns is with us. Oh, I love it. <laughs> George Burns comes on the show all the time. My aunt collected dolls. Yes. And I'm talking thousands of dollars of really intense, serious dolls. And this is the George Burns. He's very, very heavy, very solid. He's on a pedestal. He's got his dress shoes and everything. And he pops on the show. Sometimes there was the latter part. But he's here and he's all excited. He's got his cigar and he's got his red <laughs> pocket square. And uh, he sends his lovey to you. So... Don't worry about it. You, there's know. nothing. You're gonna. You're not gonna take us out. And if you have some puppets, there, bring them on. Oh, actually, Do you have Jim, uh, Kukla, Jim? Fran, and Ollie. Yeah, actually. <laughs> oh, that's that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the songwriting and producing and doing all of that stuff um, can be a very lonely and isolated kind of thing. Yeah. So you know, you sometimes you need someone to help you. Ah, Gumby! <laughs> Gumby! Know? That's right, you know. A Gumby. If my mixes yeah. are feeling a little flat, <laughs> so um, Gumby's always there to give That's me the so thumbs cool. up. <laughs> you know who loves uh, Gumby? Is the mini-me, Mr. Lovity. Oh. <laughs> this was sent to me by Maureen in Arizona. <laughs> and it's a Mr. Lovity, and it's a mini-me that was sent. That's a great. Isn't that cool? And we do have around here, we've got a Gilligan, a little bobblehead Gilligan from Gilligan's Island from his wife, Dream of Denver, who was a guest, Bob Denver's wife. We've got Don Fuller Love, who was Goldie Wilson in the Back to the Future series. Wow. We've got the, uh, over here is the I Dream of Genie bottle. So, you know, we're into the whole thing, that's, right? That's but great. Gumby. <laughs> Gumby. Is Pokey there too? Or uh... You know what? <laughs> 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 oh, what happened to poor Pokey? Well, you know, I got into a little bit of trouble because um, I live, you know, in Manhattan and, you know, there's a pooper scooper law and it was just too much to take care of. Oh, yeah. But, I could, so so oh, did, I they, did they confiscate your Pokey? Yeah. <laughs> he's actually working now. He's in the, the park. You know, we're trying. <laughs> if somebody tuned in right now and I'm talking about Peter I, Bliss and his I pokey know. confiscated by the city of New York, yes. they're going to be like, what? <laughs> it's what one of the reasons on? one of the reasons why it's safest for me to just sit here and write songs sit there and, and just uh, you know <laughs> now, how many instruments do you play for those who are watching who are taking all this in? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, guitar was always my main instrument. Um, I picked up piano, uh, listening to Elton John do his live uh, broadcast on WPLJ back in the yeah. 70s, 70, and also Joni Mitchell's For Free. I have to say that um, in sixth, seventh grade, Joni's first album was probably one of the biggest influences on my guitar playing, the alternate tunings. Um, her lyrical majesty is just you know, amazing. Yeah. But when I heard her heard her song for free, yeah, um, there was a piano, a Baldwin acrosonic upright in my living room in the house, and that was for my older brother to play. But I sat down and I poked that thing out, note for note, and again, self-taught. I've actually become quite accomplished as a keyboard player somehow over all the years. All by um, ear? Yeah, yeah, all by ear, yeah. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Actually, <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, you know what? If you just left your own devices, you try to figure out a way. Well, I didn't know how yeah. to tune the guitar originally, but I still poked out melodies on it and tried to figure out how to make noise on it. 
That's so, unbelievable. Um, we, uh, I was telling you about yeah. my aunt up in uh, Massachusetts. The, yeah. They're on the lake up there. And when I was a kid, we, you know, we, we still go up to visit the whole family up there. But yeah. we would come up from New York and from Long Island. And we'd go up to visit everybody in Connecticut and Massachusetts and the whole New England contingent on my mom's side. Yes. And we'd go up to northern Massachusetts. And, and they, my aunt and uncle, my brother's brother, and uh, brother Fred and wife Dorith, who's from Vienna, Austria originally, mm -hmm. have this beautiful upright piano. And, uh, you know, like 10 years old, I would just go right into that big dining room yes. and just start playing. And I had the cassette deck and I would press record. And I still have the cassettes of when I was by ear, really yes. just doing my thing. Nobody was showing me what to do. I was just doing it. Uh, heart and soul, of course. Yeah. And then the theme to All in the Family. There you go. Right. It was, you know, at that age, you know, it was right. like perfect. Exactly. But same thing, I can understand. And boy, would I, you know, sometimes it would be sitting there. I'm like, let me just go in there. I want to touch that thing. I want to play that thing. And uh, what other instruments did you, uh, I, I did violin like 12, 13, 14. I, did, I was the worst violin player you could have ever They're imagined. tough. They are there, tough. I know I was I was bad. I, I was really, <laughs> yeah. really bad. See, I was blaming the violin. Um, I was saying they're tough, but yeah. you're saying you're bad. <laughs> but growing up in growing up in Yonkers, being two feet tall and going from sixth grade to the seventh to the twelfth high school. Good thing you didn't take the cello or the two. Oh, let me let me put it this way. <laughs> uh I was gonna be in the choir and the orchestra. Um, I'm also only going to live until the, <laughs> Tuesday on a Monday. Um, it was just not considered too cool. So uh, I wound up in the jazz band, the, the school jazz band oh, eventually. Yeah. But um, I, will, I, I just want to say, you know, it, it's an important thing because um, we had a music teacher who they actually renamed the auditorium. Her name was Josephine Caruso. This was Yonkers, Lincoln High School in Yonkers. But she, I don't think I went to gym once in five years. I got like a, a, a pass to get out of gym so I could go to the music room. And so what this, was the excuse that well, you were going well, to music had, room? Well, I had choir practice, uh, choral yeah, practice, yeah. the right. special concert choir practice. Um, so I, I had the coach come up to me like two weeks before graduation. You know, you're going to fail gym and not graduate because you haven't been here in six years. And you were so, like, please, <laughs> I know. please they, do. Let me, they let me go because <laughs> you know, what was the other choice but having me stick around? <laughs> right. Exactly. So were you doing what did you get involved in plays and uh, were you doing instruments for, you know, in the plays in school and everything? Yeah, I was, you know, I was being I learned how to play bass. Actually, I learned how to read bass because they needed someone to play bass in one of the shows. So the music teacher says, Pete, here, you know, so they rented me an Ampeg B-15 and a Gibson bass. Wow. And that's how I actually learned how to play bass clef. I couldn't do it now. Um, if you, you know, if you ask what I was able to do and I had a book um, and I have so many friends, dear friends who do the Broadway show thing, you know, most of my friends are, are musicians and musicians. You know, yeah. they've graduated, they've studied. The they real are, serious, uh, yeah, they're Berkeley serious. They're, and all the rest. Yeah. Oh, I was, was going to go to Berkeley. I was enrolled and I was working with a, a well-known concert, concert promoter in Boston named Don Law. And he was the guy in Boston. And he was managing uh, Livingston Taylor, uh, my friend Le Reeve Little, may he rest, John, John Pousset Dart Band, and uh, I auditioned and wound up working with all of these people. And I said, oh, why am I going to go to Berkeley when this is what I want to be doing anyway? Right. Um, you know, so I actually went up there, I think it was seven years ago to be one of the judges in a contest, a, a song and production contest, which I thought was interesting because it was the only way I ever got into the school <laughs> was as a guest. But um <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. My father has always told me, Jim, you should have gone into comedy. Have you been told that too? Um, you, there's by no all way of, you haven't. Right. By my ex-wife who says, I think that's funny. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know. <laughs> 
I, you know, we went before the we went before the judge, and the judge says, "Give me your best one," and I gave it to him. He says, "You might as well throw yourself on the mercy of the court." Now. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, I, I, let's enough of me. Now, did you write a song about that experience, like some people do? Yes, yeah. No, there there's a yes. song to write about every experience, about every experience yes, in life, for sure. So how did you? How did these? start rolling for you okay from you know the kid that's doing all of this and really falling in love with it and learning by ear and mm -hmm. being a part of the school plays and those how did it be how did it start to become a real professional endeavor for you peter what were some of those steps and what were some of those opportunities that came your way yeah. for the exposure and working with people at higher levels and they're realizing your your talent and sort of bringing you into the musical fold well, you know, I, I would start with a quick um, intro into my father being an ad man, his own company, oh, yeah. and he had somebody who did his jingles for the him. Jingles, yes. You know, a very well-known team, Vardy and Hambro. Um, Emmanuel Vardy was a pretty well-known arranger um, in his time. I love and, we, we've yeah. had a lot of jingle conversations on this show. I missed oh, yeah. So in 11th grade, and I actually... I, if I'm correct of the date, I actually think it was the date that Hendrix died. Oh, but I, oh. I was brought down with um, my two guitars by my dad to Lenny, the, the jingle office, you know, and I said, I'm going to play for you because my dad wanted Lenny, his jingle guy, to say, does he have talent? So I went down, I played my songs. Lenny said, the kids got it. And that was in 11th grade, 12th grade. Lenny took me into a recording studio named JAC on 57th and 6th Avenue. And I had put a combo of a percussionist, another guitarist, and a bass player and myself. And we recorded three songs live um, with Lenny producing. And I got four publishing deal offers and wound up signing with Buddha. I was doing the go take the subway down after my last class, second half of senior year, mom would drop me at the subway or I'd take the bus to the subway, go down, I would meet the, with these record people. And, you know, at the, at the end of the day, they all talked to each other. And they decided that Buddha, Bob Reno and Eddie O'Loughlin, dear Eddie, and, you know, who's still next plateau records, um, you know, they signed me. So, I had always been recording on my own. Um, a wonderful fellow in my neighborhood up in Yonkers named Danny Block, he seemed to have all of these four track recorders. So I was learning how to record with my dad's little sound non sound. So I was making all of these recordings that were the basis for all of my demos, basically. Um, I did my deal. I went to college. I was barely in college. I came back. I played the bitter end for the first time the summer of 72. Wow. Um, which is weird because I do my my events there for my New York Songwriters Collective now. That's 50 years ago. So Is that not hard to believe? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. But I have to give my I have to say my give my parents credit for allowing me to be who I was. Yes. And if I wanted it badly enough and I worked hard enough, it was fine. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, as lazy as I think I am, I'm, you know, I guess I'm not, but, um, <laughs> I came back to New York from Boston when I finally got a manager through my lawyers down in the city. Um, and I wound up doing a production deal with a wonderful producer that was part of, um, the Canadian contingent. There was a guy named Jack Richardson, Nimbus Productions, I think was the name. And Bob Ezrin was sort of part of that part. And Bob is famous for Alice Cooper or Pink oh, Floyd. Yeah. And around the time that I did my album, he was working on Peter Gabriel's solo album. Um, there was one wonderful memory of me doing one of my own songs on my album called Angel. And we had the same arranger, string arranger that did sometimes when sometimes when we touch Dan oh, Hill song. Such a great song. Yeah. Every time I hear it, I, I just love that song. So we hired a 40 piece orchestra and those guys wrote the arrangement. 
Wow. And the first time I ever recorded one of my, my only song I had written on piano at that point, I'm sitting there with that orchestra playing it live at the Hit Factory, recording it. I did the vocal later, um, but I remember that Bob was, Bob Ezrin was in the studio watching. Um, so it was, it, it was really quite exciting, all of those yeah. things. And I just kept pushing. You know, I never, you know, back in those days, um, it was like, I, you know, you breathe, you eat, you mm -hmm. live, and you what make you're doing. And honestly, I didn't have anybody I had to take along for the ride. Right, you, know? you, were, you had I a wasn't... path going forward, right? Right, exactly. Did you get involved in the jingle world at all since your dad was in the a advertising? I kind of sucked at that. <laughs> No, no. I mean, honestly. Oh, um, a pepper. You're a pepper. No, no, no. I know the guy who wrote that. I'm he's sure you dear, do. No, no. He's a dear <laughs> friend. Jake, no, Jake Holmes. Jake Holmes. He's a dear friend. Yeah. Um, they were all I, terrific. Stuff. All terrific. Yeah. You know what? I, I gave Jingles um, in one of those interim periods where I said, I need to get a job. <laughs> you know? Um, uh I remember trying for six months and doing all of this freelance work with some of the major New York houses. And at the end of six months, I had like a six minute reel of songs that I still hadn't gotten paid to dem for the demos. And it really wasn't very gratifying. Um, so I just left the jing that jingle part of it behind. Uh, I found in all of these other niches, niches to go into, um, like the corporate thing, uh, which was insane. That was just ridiculous. Yeah, tell us how you went into that area. Um, again, it was a situation where somebody said, we're looking for a writer uh, for a company based in New York who uh, was doing all of this corporate music. And essentially corporate music is where you're doing yeah. uh, industrials. It's for in-house, it's, yeah. it's for your sales force. Like it's production music. And there's and, yeah. actually a famous, there's a movie out about it because a lot of composers lived off these shows all of these years. I thought I heard, yeah, what was there that is, called? Yeah, there I, is something. I don't remember. Maybe yeah. one of the people who are listening, if uh, any of my friends who are in that corporate world are listening, they yes. can you know, send the info. But uh, I could write a pop song. I could write a song that felt like it was a real song. Yeah. But I also could rhyme things like, um, you know, ethanol estradiol. I mean... Literally, I'm writing songs for drugs. You know, the drug Celebrex, I wrote a song for the meeting to introduce that drug to their entire staff. Ethanol estradiol? Wow. Eth okay, so this is She sat silly. next to me in third grade. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm having a, a meeting with a, my, my daughter's pediatrician. And, you know, she said, well, you know, she's having some pain and this and that. And I said, well, what about birth control? You know, that's a way to, to to cover that. He says, well, and what about seasonal or seasonique? And I go, how do you know about that? I says, are you a doctor? I said, no, I write songs about <laughs> songs. Yes, they and I, we, I did the show to introduce that drug to. And all I can say is, as a songwriter, and I can only say it's worse now. I mean, mm. that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. But even different. as a songwriter, if you had a hit song, number one, today, you had nine months to wait for you to get any royalties from any of the performing rights organizations. You might be able to get an advance from a publisher, but the publishers really weren't paying you over, uh, once every six months. And the record companies were holding their royalties in a flow over the course of three years. So the idea was how do you continue to buy macaroni and cheese, five boxes for a buck, while you're waiting for any of those royalties to hit your mailbox? God, so, you can't even afford the Hawaiian Punch or Nestle's Quick or Jiffy Pop. <laughs> the Jiffy Pop was tough. How do you get that up? <laughs> you know, but so, you know, the reality is, is that, um, you know, fortunately, I think the career, I mean, the key to my survival has been diversifying. Yes. Um, I yeah. think that's, you know, um, and, 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 you know, again, to this day, I, I feel torn between all of these different things I want to do. I just have to remember that I don't need to do it with the same energy or purpose other than more enjoyment now than I did before. 
Um, and yeah. why is that? Why do you think that is more control over what you're doing? I think when you're younger, one, your ego. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether your ego is stronger. Yeah. Uh, or, or it dissipates. Yeah. But the need to prove oneself and the need constantly. Right. right. And also, I think, you know, what everybody is struggling to get is any sort of how do I get on the map? How do I even, you know, how does somebody even recognize me? Right. Um, I remember for all of my workshops I teach, somebody came to me and says, you know, Peter, I am out of way for you to have the greatest, most successful workshop in the world. And I say, what is it? All you have to do is come up with the formula for how everybody and anybody can have a hit song and get discovered. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, there's a reason, there's a reason why that doesn't work. Right, exactly. <laughs> Because there really isn't, there really isn't. There's no magic formula necessarily, right? It's right. just there's certain formatics, but not necessarily yeah. the magic uh, formula. It really is. It's it's quite amazing when you think about it. You, you've had these opportunities. You know, when moving to Boston, you worked with uh, Reeve Little and Jonathan Edwards yeah. as well. And that was kind of cool, huh? I was abs It was incredible, you know? I mean, first of all, um, to to meet and work with some of these people in whatever capacity with john it was as a player um um with reeve it was as a player and, and reeve wrote his own but Livingston taylor we we practically were you know joined at the hip for many for a good year in tours you know um and Livingston is just uh, uh, just that's the whole family but Livingston's a sweetheart um, and he, you know, he's done a good deal of teaching and God bless him. He's still performing. And so is Jonathan Edwards, um, yeah. Tom Chapin, who I actually met, um, I wound up being managed by Ken Cragen's company and the New York contingent. That's how the whole Peter Wolf thing happened. I was looking for a second record deal in 1979 and I was with him, a publisher who sent my music over to a company called Hart and Hinkle, which was part of Ken Cragen's management. And Ken, Ken was managing two of the biggest acts at the time, Kenny Rogers and Lionel Richie. Um, you know, and Gallagher, the comedian, also um, Kim Carnes of the Betty Davis Eyes uh, fame. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. all goes back. Gallagher they with wound, the watermelons. Exactly. Yes. And around the same time that they signed me, um, to look for another artist deal. They started working with Harry Chapin. They actually brought Harry Chapin into the fold. Mm. This is just before Harry passed on in right. that tragic the accident. The Long Island Expressway. Exactly. And, yeah. and then, so Tom sort of picked up the ball. So we toured, Tom is, Tom, I mean, these are just sweetheart, sweetheart people. And the fact that there's, these are people that are f still friends and, yeah. you know, it was just wonderful memories. But, um, that's how the whole Peter Wolf situation came about, which was really my first tracking sing single. My album, you know, didn't do very much. My mother bought it. I gave her the 698 back. <laughs> <laughs> was it this one? Oh, God, get out. All right. And there's a story. Wait a minute. That, if, you, oh if you stand back a little bit, it's Leo Sayer. Oh, exactly. <laughs> And there's a hard, there's a, George, there's a, hey, ba, 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 that ba, ba, was ba. never supposed that, to be the cover. That wasn't, huh? No, no. Um, you know, the, 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 the JMS exclusive. Was, what, what, oh my yes. God. Was well, it let, was it let, <laughs> <laughs> your dad would have loved that, huh? In advertising. All right. <laughs> Everything I mean, to him was an exclusive, right? I, now, were you trying to get in or trying to get out with you that know what? cover? Okay. <laughs> That I had just come from the um, the critical care intensive care unit of the hospital. My mom had had a heart attack, oh, boy. and I had a I had the photo sh shoot scheduled for that afternoon. Really, and I let everybody know. Yeah, the only way you could by putting a dime in the phone. Yes, and, and right. letting them know I couldn't make it. I had I got back down to the city. Incredible. And they call me up and they go, can you meet us at the office? And I did. And that was what I was wearing when we went to the hospital. And they said, well, let's just take some shots. The guy's here. We paid him. And before I know it, that's the cover. <laughs> so it's all good.
it's but all it, good it it worked hey it yeah worked, right and you know yeah, what yeah. and you're right it is the leo Sayer do <laughs> it has the sort of leo Sayer, right <laughs> oh my god okay that's me that's oh me a few, that's a all right now that's an interesting uh story about that that's a segue right exactly you just keep doing i love these exclusives these are all i tell you i'm gonna have nightmares about this later i'm just kidding (laughs) you're gonna write a song about it about love it master show love yes um well here you know there's an interesting story about that song you know um for all of the writers that you know we all know and love and the songs that they've written that are great there are all of the unsung, unheralded, mm-hmm. uh, insane stories about um, what happens to songs that don't quite ever get to where they were meant to get. Yeah. And what kind of world was one of those tunes where I wrote it and I presented it to a publisher? This was go back in 1985. And they, they were looking for a movie for Laura Branigan to sing um, two or three tunes. Um, The song got to the people. They loved the tune for her and thought it was perfect for the movie. They decided that they already had the song they needed for the movie. So from what I understand, this song was the first song that went to um, Laura working on her new album with that producer. Um, So I actually signed a, a publishing agreement with this company starting with the basis of that song being recorded three years go by and the song is on hold which is something that publishers give you know there's it's it's there's really no money at least it wasn't back then um and we honored that hold there were other artists of import who were interested in the song but we said no because it's in the loop Um, At the end of the day, uh, they took my ballad song off to put a a dance song on. Mm. And, you know, the album did whatever, whatever. But uh, so that song somewhere is in some vault, probably Atlantic. That's Atlantic was um, Laura's label. And I'd love to I'd just love to hear it. Mm. There's another story. There's another story like that that I've got. There are a bunch of them. They're fantastic stories. Yeah, there but, but there are a bunch of them. But you know, so all of us, all of us writers, the ones, um, I would dare say, you know, I'll throw Diane Warren in there. But um, all of our songs don't smack against the wall. They're usually rejected at least two or three times before somebody thinks it's a hit. Um, you know, that's the old Beatles story. You know, we Decca, you know, said no to them. Um, so it's, it just comes with the territory. You just have to keep writing the songs, keep getting them out there and doing your thing. That's right. You know? Exactly. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. That's what you need to do. And you've, you've been doing it. Uh, you had an opportunity, um, like you said, record tour yeah. with Tom Chapin, the Jay Giles band behind you. Uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Peter Wolf turned to you to help create the top 40 hit. I need you tonight from the lights out album. Very cool. That story. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, these are all very interesting stories and it's interesting that album, you can't stream that album now. Is Peter, there is it a copyright thing? Probably. Uh, you know what? Um, this just came up this past week, but um, Kim Carnes mm-hmm. has an album out that, is, is sort of floating. It's that it was an EMI uh, recording. Yeah. Bet um, Kim Carnes the same. Peter's first two solo albums. And I dare say that the Jay Giles album that came out once Peter left, which came out maybe a year after the Peter Wolf solo album, I don't even think those are available for streaming. So I think they're probably caught up in some sort of interesting, yeah. strange thing. Yeah. But the way that whole thing with Peter Wolf happened, um, you know, they they were at the pinnacle of their success. I mean, they were they had come off of Centerfold and Freeze Frame. And again, they were managed by the people who were managing me. Uh, Don Covey, you know, the brilliant 
original, he wrote Chain of Fools for Aretha, yeah. uh, Mercy, oh, Mercy, yeah. and so many other tunes. Peter Peter is a Bible of of music, R&B music. He is so knowledgeable, and he, he is friends with all of these people. So they wanted to get together, and they just yeah. said, well, why don't you... Don Covey, yeah. Yeah, so you say, why don't you all come get together at Peter's place, which is right here. They literally were in this room, mm. and we we put down a, a good six or seven tunes, including Lights Out, um, which was the first single from the record. Um, and, you know, putting aside all of the business issues and whatever, the idea of being in the room with um, with Don and singing and playing and, you know, and then doing some writing with Peter as well was just, you know, it's kind of insane. And what's an aside to it, my summer job that my dad got me in 70, 71 was as the go-to gopher guy for location recorders. They were the ones who recorded the live Allman Brothers album. Sure, yeah. So I was in the truck for that record for the last night at the Fillmore East and who opened for the Allmans that night. One of them was Jake Isles. So, oh, wow. so working with Peter at that point, 10 years later in 82, um, he kind of, I, from what I understand, he sort of brought back what was done to the rest of the band. And I think, you know, th there had always been friction, you know, th it, that's when you've been in a family like that together for God knows how many years, I mean, they'd been playing for 15, 20 years, um, and living in close quarters. So, uh, kind of like what they, happened during the last three years. <laughs> well, they, yeah, exactly. They, they, I think it just sort of disintegrated. Um, mm. but, uh, it, it's, yeah. it, it was interesting, but that was a thrill. And Peter was a sweetheart, you know, a real character. And Don was great. Don, um, and I wound up doing some work post that. Um, he unfortunately had a stroke, um, and and was incapacitated for a good 10 12 years and he he passed maybe yeah. like 3 4 years ago but oh, um beautiful. again these i mean yeah. the fact that i'm in the room that you're still there and and, and, and some I, you know yeah, yeah. You know. somebody else Streisand, with this iconic <laughs> song i mean you're working closely with richard perry record producer back in 85 and you helped guide barbara Streisand through her vocal performance of yeah. The song Emotion, which became the title of her album, yeah. with the song being released as a single, a dance 12 inch <laughs> video co starring the Who's Roger Daltrey. I mean, how incredible is that? What was it like working with Barbara Streisand on that and that whole experience for you? Um, that, that was that was yeah. um, <laughs> that was an incredible Fellini movie ish like yes. experience. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, when I the whole story behind the song getting to her, yes, um, is you know really the right song at the right place at the right time, yes, uh, which was wonderful. Um, a, an, an amazing publishing company uh, named Almo Irving, which was part of A and M Records family, um, they were very proactive, and they had been working with my management, the Ken Cragen's management. Um, and I remember them calling me up and saying, you know, Peter, we don't have a New York office. Uh, we will get you out here. Well, maybe we'll do some work with you. And I remember just saying, um, you know what? It's never going to happen. Let me just send you songs. If you like one, pitch it. If you get a cut, we'll make an arrangement. We'll do a deal. Talk to my manager about it. I, I don't remember writing a motion, but it was soon after. I sent it to them, and they sent it to Richard Perry, who put it on hold for Burton Cummings from the Guess Who. Mm. Burton had a song, um, Stand Tall, Don't You Fall. That was his single, and I think Richard produced that. So he was looking for the follow-up album. Just so you know, Omnivore Records just released that Burton Cummings follow-up album, I think, two years ago. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I get a phone call from my management saying, listen, P Peter, 
you got to give us a call back. And this is when I'm one of the first phone machines, like a phone mate, which had like a reel to reel recorder. Right. Yeah. Peter, call us back. You know, um, we've got some news. Burton Cummings isn't doing the song. And I was heartbroken. And they go, no, Peter, Peter, calm down. Something a little bit better happening here. Because because Barbara Streisand is. And, uh, you know, within that afternoon, I was on the phone with um, uh, a sweetheart of a guy who actually is, is Omnivore Records, Brad Rosenberger, who is Richard's point person there. And within two weeks, I was out working on the track with Steve Mitchell and Gary Scardina, who were the, the producers and writers of the Pointer Sisters jumped to my love. Oh, that was yeah. the big record of the time. Oh, yeah. Which is sure. why the Pointer Sisters are singing backgrounds on emotion. It was just. We, just, we had Anita and Ruth on not that long ago. Oh, and we need Anita, and we Anita of course, lost. passed. I know, I know. And boy, was that so much fun to have Anita and Ruth oh. on the show. And we had just really, if anybody wants to see that episode, it's on our YouTube channel. Jim I'm Masters going to check it out. Well, now that I know you, Jim, I can binge watch I, Jim Masters. You can binge watch hundreds of episodes. <laughs> that episode, very popular. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of views on that one. And yeah. Lucy Arnaz and a few other exact, fantastic yeah. people. But as there will be with uh, Peter Bellis. Oh, well, well, we'll see. You know, but <laughs> well, um, we'll see. <laughs> but I know. All but it's interesting. So <laughs> the thing is, but when I got there, um, I wasn't so I wasn't supposed to be doing anything other than dropping off my drum program that I had done on my Lind drum on a analog cassette, and then and I and then I, for the Lind drum and they go where are you le where are you going? I had writing appointments set up by the publisher for the next two weeks, mm. and they say you have to you have to be here. So we started tracking the song the way Richard likes to work or liked to work at that point. Yeah. If he liked the way a song sounded, he wanted the person who made the recording and the demo, which I had done all of in my living room studio here. He wanted it recreated in his studio, Studio 55 on Melrose, and then he would take it from there. So I spent three or four days in in a different key because Barbara obviously had a different key. Um, so I had to recreate the song from scratch um, it was it was it was a a bit of an ordeal, um, and there were certain people at that point. This was for all of the music people out there. This was pre MIDI. MIDI had just come into being, um, so it wasn't easy to just go in with a computer program or something or a sequencer, press a button, and all of the instruments would just be there. Um, so we painstakingly rebuilt the track, and uh, my first session with Richard. Uh, Nathan East was playing bass and I, you know, Richard said, you know, Peter was wonderful, this and that, you know, and I was thrilled. I mean, I, Richard Perry was one of my heroes. Uh, the Ringo album, that first Ringo album, the Carly Simon Hotcakes record, uh, Barbara Streisand's Stony End. Um, I mean, Richard's career span and what he had done, I was almost more thrilled that I was working with Richard than Barbara at that moment. Um, at, at that time, I, I asked Richard, I said, listen, I would love to be a fly on the wall when she comes in to sing. I'll just stand back. I won't say a word. And he said to me, no, you have to be there. You have to be there. Yes. Um, yeah. So I remember the day that she came in and um, it was it was the day I met Charlie Koppelman, who was the executive producer on the album. Charlie, may he rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, an incredible record man of all, you know, for so long. And the entertainment company. Uh, so he walks in with Barbara and her a, a, a small entourage. And she proceeds to sing the song four times. And um, it, it was it wasn't quite there. Um, so she came in and she took me aside and she says, Peter, can I talk to you? And though I wish I had a tape recorder and, and I had, and the instamatic at that point, yes. but she says to me, Peter, I love the song and I, I think your voice is incredible. She, I mean, so I said, well, I, I love, I would love to hear, you know, I would love to be able to record this. Uh, and she laughed and she smiled. She's cause I had done her guide vocal three keys higher than I had sung it originally on my demo. 
Oh, wow. So I'm singing like in the stratosphere. Yeah, my balls hadn't quite descended yet. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> she said to me, Peter, be honest with me. Why don't you know, I don't quite have this. What am I doing? And I want you to be honest with me. And I told her, I said, you know, Barbara, the song is not a ballad. It's like a rhythmic, you know, it's a very strong beat. And you're sort of allowing the beat to happen and then you're jumping in and you're sort of following the beat. I think if you take the lead and you jump on it and you're you're right present or you're you're almost like you're pulling the band with you. Mm -hmm. And she says, thank you for being honest. I understand. She went in to sing it two more times. And then what she does, you know, back what most artists do these days, um, it's just done in a different way because back then we were using tape machines. Right. So she would sing all of those six tracks she'd done, and I have a cassette of all of them <laughs> that no one will ever hear. But, that's it, yeah. Right, that's, you know, that's... Put that in the safe deposit box. That's, that's all there, but, you know, for my own thing. But she made a comp vocal. She took the lyric sheet. She made columns. She picked the, the lines she liked the most from each take. And then she asked the engineer to put a comp track together, which meant that the best lines of all those six tracks would be made into one vocal track. And while she was doing this, Richard turns to me and while he's ordering Tofuti for everybody, he says, she's going to be back. And indeed, Barbara came back two more times to sing. Um, yeah, and it was, it was, you know, that's one of those things you don't, you, you know, you don't forget. Um, an incredible song, uh, you know, well, really, absolutely. You know, yeah. you know what? Um, I don't know. <laughs> For yourself? <laughs> you know, I think, you know, as writers, we all have our favorites and whatever. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, I've had people come up and say, boy, those lyrics really mean this, that to me. And boy, yeah. you really nailed it. And I go. I'm sure you do. You have people that feel attached yeah. to it and it's meant a lot to them in their life or what have yeah. you. or you know, I don't, I don't to... count it as one of my five. Not songs your personal top. That do this right. to me. Right. You know? And <laughs> honestly, fun. and honestly, of all the songs that I would wish Barbara Streisand would sing, let it have been a ballad. <laughs> <laughs> let it have been a nice ballad. <laughs> right. That's Uncle Joe and Yonkers. <laughs> well, actually, and, and then just so you know, the best part of doing this thing with Streisand was whenever I would go home for the holidays and unc and my uncle was there who'd say, when is he going to get a real job and a haircut? Um, my mom would say, he can't. He's in the studio with Barbara Streisand. That shut everybody up. That would do the trick. That right. shut it up. Right. So now I, now I don't need to get a real job. <laughs> That's, anyway, that, that anyway. took care of it, huh? Yeah, That's, we tried. Yeah. You, you know, you uh, you also Dan Hartman, of course. Uh, we know from a lot of great yeah. music. H um, how did this interaction come All about? All right, um, Dan was Dan. You know, and again, gone too soon, of course, too. Of, of yeah, yeah. Um, again, Dan happened. I was again writing for Chapel Intersong at the time, and there was an artist named Hilly Michaels who was one of the first MTV artists. He had a cartoonish kind of video for Calling All Girls. And it was a huge record. Roy Thomas Baker was producing and you know, the Queen and, and the Cars. Um, and he was working on a second record and he was published by the publisher I was working with. And he needed help writing lyrics and melodies for some of his songs. So I go over to Hilly's house. He plays me some tracks he's doing. I take him home. And actually, in one night, I wrote three lyrics. Mm. And two days later, I'm in the studio. I'm trying to remember. I think it was it was right over Manny's. I, I keep getting the names screwed up on 48th Street. So I go in and I sing him the songs. And he goes, holy shit. So... He goes and he does his lead vocal and he says, can you come back in and do some background vocals with me? So I go back in a few days later and he's there with Dan Hartman and Rick Derringer. And they're all, we're all singing on the songs, including the ones I wrote. Um, so I got to be friendly with Dan and Dan was working with the Average White Band as well at the time. 
as a producer, and I was working with Alan Gorey, who was the bass player. Uh, it's funny how all of these synapses are firing. They may yes. never fire after this again. But, this is that, well, we're, right. we're, re we're recording this. Right. It'll be in the archives. <laughs> I know. But what I loved about that session um, was you have Dan Hartman and Rick Derringer. Um, they were both part of the Edgar Winter, you know, white trash um, and Frankenstein and free ride. Dan was an, uh, is a consummate guitar player, lead player as well. I mean, free ride, that's Dan, that's his lick. Um, so the way it worked was a little bit of a steely Dan kind of thing where for the guitar solos, I'm sitting there and Dan would go in and then Rick would go in and they would try to see who's, who's exactly, <laughs> exactly. Dan and then Rick. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, so in between singing with them and doing this, it was it was just, you know, one of those things where, wow, you know? Yeah, huh? um, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I remember buying Hang On Sloopy, running to Sam Goody's and buying Hang On Sloopy when, you know, that was Rick. Yeah. Now it's Rick. So Another great, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And of course... I can dream about you was oh. so iconic for Dan Hartman, and they still. Yeah, every yeah. time you hear it, it you just right. go back in time. And he had a great voice. Oh, really? And a terrific. He, yes, and he actually he had a he one of his possibly his biggest hit was a disco hit. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but he had his own imprint. There was an imprint on Columbia Records, um, but he had a, a disco song that was it just like totally monopolized the charts for a long time. But again, Dan was one of the nicest, sweetest guys whenever talking to him on the phone or whatever. And yeah, you know, we lost a lot. We've lost a lot of people along the way. Yeah, for sure. absolutely. Know? Yeah. On, on so many different levels. Absolutely. Uh, going back a little bit, even yeah. Menudo. <laughs> <laughs> that's incredible. I mean, they, they were so incredibly popular now you would think i could have either retired or bought a little island just with know, somewhere the in the caribbean experience. from that right 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 well you know i think that was an album that i think somebody whatever they made off that album but yeah the funny story about that record is that it was originally picked up by a group called x change mm -hmm. which was ricky martin and the boys who aged out of menudo Right. And they were going to actually do a record. I know Atlantic, um, I remember the meeting about it, where they picked the song. And it was called Nights on Fire. And they had done a, a demo of it, but the record never came out. I don't think the group ever floated. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Menudo releases the song a year or two later. Um, for songwriters out there, for anybody out there who's done anything like this, if your songs have ever been promoted or pitched or... It's amazing what you find on YouTube. I actually Googled and YouTube that song, and there's like two live Minuto performances of them doing the song in a huge arena. Um, meanwhile, I didn't make enough money from it to be able to get to the show. I was going to say, <laughs> right. It's like something's not, something's backwards there. Ah, uh, you know it's what? You're finding it on the internet to oh, realize like, no, it you know. Wow. You know what? It's just it's it's part just part of the, the whole it's way just it works. A part of the deal. The craziness of you it know, all. Huh? It's all, you know. Um yeah. but uh, I don't you know, I'll let you I don't want to take up too much time on anything. What would you like me to do, Jim? How would you like me to do this? Because I'm not sure how much time we have or how oh, you work this. We got plenty. What about okay. South by Johnny? Johnny. Yeah. All right. Okay. The audience is loving. They've been commenting throughout. They already said, <laughs> okay. you are well, a Gym Master Show lovity. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. They, they love it. So, Southside Johnny, um, incredible producer, dear friend producer, Stephen Skinner. Um, uh, one of his major credits is he's actually the person who arranged and recorded the Rent um, mm -hmm. soundtrack. Yeah. Um, you know, with Ar Arif Martin, another sweetheart and gem of a person. He also is the person who arranged one of my dear friends, number one Grammy winning song uh, from a distance, Julie Gold. Mm. Um, so Steve was um, hired, I think it was 88. 
yeah, 88 or so, to produce a solo album by Southside Johnny. He was actually not going by Johnny Lyons, mm -hmm. uh, his, his formal name. Right. And it was on a small label called Cypress. So, you know, Steve put out the word for songs, and I sent him what I feel is one of my best songs, the one that I really love, called Act of Love. Yeah. And he pitched it to Johnny and Johnny loved it and they recorded it. And I got to do the guitar work and work with him. And he was a real, you know, a real character, you know. Um, and Steve, was, you know, Steve, of course, is great. That song is also not available. I actually was able to find a CD of it. Um, is that amazing there. how that is? <laughs> you know, yeah. It is. It is. Talk about is. your variety, too, and, you know, to show the level of skill and your abilities, uh, even working with the Osmond brothers as well. Well, that now grandma would have loved this because when grandma used to babysit us, we used to have to watch those guys on Saturday night yes. <laughs> with Andy Williams, with Andy, Andy Williams, Williams show. Sure. He right. brought them on. Right. So gave him the break. Uh, one of the songs I wrote found its way to. Is it Jimmy? Was it? I mean, I'm trying to remember or which one. Donnie? Yeah, it wasn't Donnie. I wish it was Donnie. Of oh, course, the youngest, was, the youngest brother. Yeah, I think it was Jimmy. Jimmy, Austin. That would Jimmy, be Jimmy sang. Jimmy sang the song on one of the specials. So, I, I keep thinking one of their TV specials. So I'm still thinking that Grandma's looking down and going, "You did good." Yeah, but she, she never liked Jimmy. <laughs> she she thought he was obnoxious. <laughs> She liked all the others. She liked the others. That's right. Brought in. That's right. <laughs> you know that, what I mean? Oh that is gosh. funny. I, I just were, you know, bouncing around with variety here, but also uh, Paul Abdul. Okay, she, here's the you story. got me wrong. Here's the Paul, here's That's the Paul the Abdul story. story. If you Google that song, yeah. that someone had put a bit of that song up online and then took it off. That song... Um, exists in a vault and it's completed it was produced and co-written with nile rogers yeah and it 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 just exists now in a vacuum uh who knows what may happen and understand this was all done prior to american yeah. idol all of the all, notoriety all of that all yes. of that, all of that notoriety. And um, oh, that's still out. That's still that's still you know what? Wow. It's the, one of those things where do I add that? Do I not? Um, do you have a I'll, lot like that. Do you have a do you have a drawer that's filled with all well, of this stuff? Well, I've got the Paula Abdul. I've got yeah. the um, certainly the Laura Branigan song. Yeah. You know, um, I did hear the Paula Abdul song over the phone once. <laughs> so it's amazing um, how you hear your own stuff. <laughs> over the phone, <laughs> too very, too right. And and I want to give a you know a shout out to Jennifer Marks, who um, was my co-writer on that song, um, and on on Thick as well. The one that you know she she entered it into the American Songwriting Contest. You you know you come prepared. I tell you, I, I, you, uh, I am another a broadcast. Just... I'm a broadcast professional, right? <laughs> um, but the, here's a here's an interesting Marks, story. Yeah. I met Jennifer in 1992, and she says, "You know, you've written, you've done all of this stuff, and you've written with all these people, and nobody, nobody will write with me of your where you are in the food chain." And I said, "Well, that's not me. You know, you you know, you come highly recommended, and the worst that happens is we sit around for an hour or two and go for lunch." Right. And she played me a song, "Start." And we wrote the song, I think, pretty much in that afternoon called Carry Me With You. Mm -hmm. And again, it never quite reached the level of the artist we wanted it to reach. It was beautifully recorded a number of times by a, a, a woman named Martha Byrne, who is famous for As the World Turns, as yes. Lily. That's yes. Right. And she's a, she, again, an incredible, incredible talent and a sweetheart. So, but all the years i've wrote yes. written there she is <laughs> people know her from as the world turns oh list. my yes god. yeah <laughs> oh my god oh boy i'm afraid i'm afraid wait till <laughs> we bring, why would we start bringing out your baby pictures <laughs> i i'm almost glad i haven't posted them <laughs> but um 
But this but was anyway, another right. working with Martha Byrne right. from the soap operas. And, yeah. yeah. But, but Jennifer, I remember this, I think it was in the year 2000, the USA Songwriting Contest was just starting to get its sea legs. And Jennifer and I wrote this song called Thick that she had done for her own album. And she submitted it. And I'll never forget, someday she said, we won. I said, what do you mean we won? We won a songwriting contest. When did we enter a songwriting contest? So... You know so, what it is? You're so you're you're so focused on the work at hand and doing the music that all these things swirling around you were just swirling around you, but you were focused on the task at hand, which was making all this incredible music. I think that's what it is. Well, yeah, yeah, and also I think it's like okay, next, <laughs> next, next it. Uh, I, yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Right, but, I got to uh, buy more macaroni and cheese. Uh, <laughs> Eric Martin. Okay, Eric, that's a wonderful story. Okay, you're asking for it. I'm giving them to I'm you. That, yeah, we love it. They're all loving okay. it. Um, I'd, okay, the, the, way that, that, the way this whole thing happened was I was going out to Los Angeles to work with Streisand and then the Pointer Sisters. Yeah. Um, during some of those trips, uh, Alma Irving, my publisher at the time, uh, was really into my catalog. And of course, Peter Wolf's I Need You Tonight was about to come out and actually had come out as a single. Yeah. Uh, one of my wonderful memories is waking up to the alarm in my in that hotel with the rotating restaurant next to Grauman's Chinese. Oh, sure. Whatever they yes. call it. Yeah. Uh, waking up in the hotel room to I Need You Tonight, my song playing on the radio. Mm. That's a very cool thing. Yes. I want that to happen again before I go. <laughs> anyway. So he put me to, he wanted me to meet with Hart about one particular song and also to potentially write with them. At least that's what I was set up to do. So I remember going to the Westwood Marquee bar area and I met John Bettis, the famous lyricist who's now part of the Songwriters Hall of Fame from a few years ago. He wrote Human Nature. Oh, um, yeah. And yeah. also partnered very much with Steve Dorff, who's another incredible composer yeah. songwriter oh, yeah. um who i spent a, an afternoon with but i remember being ushered in and a a woman named trudy i think it was trudy was i think handling that whole situation or potentially their manager at the time trudy i think went on to be manager of janet jackson um and a bunch of other people but trudy sits me down and she goes so who are you? <laughs> I go, oh, Peter Bliss. And what, are you, what have you done? <laughs> what have you done? Yeah. What have you what done? Have you I said, related? well, yeah. you know, I just, I'm in the studio. I just got out of the studio with Barbara Streisand. I've been working, you know, writing some stuff that may, you know, you know be with the pointers. And I've got the new single with Peter Wolf. And she goes, and? <laughs> My mama loves me. Yeah. I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> but anyway... But anyway, um, so I'm sitting there. So everybody, you know, it's all of the people are sitting around this big table in the bar area. And, you know, uh, Ann and Nancy come up to me and they say, listen, Peter, um, would it be OK if we go up to our room and we can talk and listen there because we're really getting hungry? So I said, sure. So I, I spent a good hour, hour and a half. We ordered some food. And I, the, I mean, just sweetest. I mean, Nancy and Ann, just the sweetest people. I mean, yeah. and, you know, I, and the song that I wanted to share with them to write with me was called Secrets in the Dark. Mm. And I never got to do it with them on that trip. I come back to New York and Chris Thompson is also working with the publisher. He's in New York recording songs for hopefully a first writer refusal thing with Atlantic Records. So he says, listen, Peter, I've got a few hours off. Let me come up to your place and we'll get together. So I said, listen, I've got this song. It's practically written already. It needs a bridge. So he says, well, listen, I can't, can't take the whole song, but you know, let's write a bridge. So we wrote the bridge and he recorded it right there. Mm. He goes back to the studio. Um, I play the song for our publisher. They say, this is great. 
I let Chris know, listen, if you want the song, Chris, for your record, he says, no. They pitched the song to Eric Martin, um, Danny Korchmore, Cooch, the guitar player for James Taylor, um, and Glenn, L Greg Ladanier, another person who he lost way too soon. They were very hot as producers back at that yeah. moment in time. Um, Don Hunley, uh, Billy Joel's River of Dreams record was, was was that production. So they got the production share to do Eric Martin's solo album with Capitol. Wow. So he records the tune. Um, I then I then find out that Chris wants the song for himself. And there got to, got to be this sort of unfortunate, strange kind of thing where they both could have just released the tune. Chris never released it, but you can now find it now. He did release it later. But it didn't make that Atlantic record. Um, and the Eric Martin album came and went. And, you know, he was going through his development as an artist. He finally... What was the name of it? You know, Jim, you know where what group that Eric Martin wound up in afterwards. I'm sure you've got it on. You want to phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's great. <laughs> that's great. I love that. Somebody out there knows. I can Google it right now if you want me to. <laughs> Your whole <laughs> life you've been discovering online, it seems. Oh, my this God. This was released 30 That's years so... later. This I heard in a phone booth. This oh. I was having meatloaf in a restaurant. All of a sudden, my song came on. I didn't know it was released. I mean, oh this my... is incredible. No, it's insane. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Listen, there's not one person who does has done this that doesn't have a s stories like this, a catalog. These of are them. incredible stories. You know, I yeah. mean, and I think it comes along with anything. A lot of you know, a lot of struggle, a lot of disappointment and, you know, learn how to love the success when it falls in your lap. Not not without your hard work and efforts, but um, Mr. Big, Mr. Big, you got it. <laughs> Doing some digging in my I was going oh, into Jim. here and said, Mr. Jim. Big. Now, if you could only tell me what my next cut in recording is going to be with what artist uh, in the future. Ooh. Ooh, you must yes. have like a Swami hat there, Jim. You want that with uh, Saturday Night's Powerball numbers as well, or? <laughs> well, you know, well, that might be a way I get that McDonald's Happy Meal and the toy. Get that Happy Meal. <laughs> it's and... not going to be from my Spotify royalties. That's right, and you get to have all the crisp cereal you want from childhood. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> that is. Oh funny. my God. That is. Oh my God. Funny. Just the variety of scope of people, even working with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Okay. People remember also from Who's the Boss? Yes, yes. Now, I didn't work personally with her, but I wrote a song that was, you know, the first yeah. song on that particular album. Yeah. Let's Go Bang. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't pick the single or the title, but, but um, a dear friend of mine actually produced an album for, for Jennifer Love Hewitt before this particular Atlantic recording. And again, she um, she was a very, she still, I mean, she's still here, obviously, a dear person, a yes. dear person. And oh, you know, yeah. she was she was like um, the Britney Spears and the, the um, Justin Timberlakes of the world. Yes. They all came out of that, Kids Incorporated, Disney. Right. You know, so th they were all prepped, they were all camera ready in every single way to be the stars they were. Uh, Aaron it, Carter too, but his uh, life went off into a, he was a very, he was a real talent, Yeah, yeah yes. but just his life went into a direction that was so unfortunate and yeah. didn't have people around him that, you know. Well, all the stories, I mean, you know, you can look bad. at the music people, but if you look at all of the chill, the child actors and all of the issues, um, there's someone I'm friends with on Facebook, Billy, Bill Mooney. Uh, who was in Lost in Space. Oh, Lost in Space, yes. He's friends with one of my dear friends. Um, and he's a who, musician. He's a, you know, he plays, he, you know. Buffy Ford Stewart, who was, the, yeah. who is the wife of the late John Stewart from yes. Kingston Trio. Sure, of course. Billy, I'd love to get Billy on the show, I know. Because oh, we, yeah. we had Angela Cartwright on, who played his sister of course, on Lost of course. Space. Of course, I had a crush on her on the Danny Thomas show. <laughs> tell, tell Billy to get on to the gymnastics show. I know. I, I knew there was a problem with me when I was having crushes on Wednesday Adams 
and Angela oh, Cartwright yes, O'Day. Right. <laughs> right. I was a little goth, you know. I was not, goth back not Barbara <laughs> Eaton and Elizabeth Montgomery. Let's not even go there. <laughs> That's not even gonads there. <laughs> oh my god! I was gonna say. I mean, no, no, no. I know. I know. Uh, I know. Here's another Anita, of course, Hegeland. Now, uh, you know what? I that's interesting. That's a picture I've never seen. Um, that's because you're on the Gymnaster show. That's you? true. <laughs> um, Your whole life is flashing before you here. Yes. You're learning so much about yourself on this episode. I, I really am. I said, so she actually, that's the lady who sang that song? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, I had a wonderful relationship with a, a music publisher named Pure Music. And they're, mm -hmm. they're now um, possibly the largest still independent uh, music publishing company um, with all of the companies that used to be out there right. in the world. Um, you know, the Universals and the Sonys and the, you know, the Chapels, Warners now, have sort of like sucked up and, and accommodated and brought in all of these songs. In a lot of ways, the writers and uh, honestly, the songs are getting lost because how do you maintain catalog unless you've got a, a major staff of people once you bring that amount of catalog in. Peer is self-contained, independent, and they also have offices worldwide. So almost all of my international music came from my three years with Peer. And I have a great fondness for all of those people. I mean, Ralph Peer, the son of the, the, the founder of the company, um, when my daughter was born, sent a little Tiffany silver spoon, you know, which is in my daughter's you know, box of life now. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, and all, it's just a, it's wonderful when you meet business people and you, you're able to form relationships that go above and beyond. And that was, that was peer. And that, that still is peer. I have a great deal of fondness for them. And I, honestly, I'll have to say, I have a great deal of fondness and respect for everybody who believed in me enough from the day I got out of high school. Yes. I wasn't necessarily ready for prime time or even day daytime. Daytime or <laughs> but they saw something and they invested their time, energy, belief and money. So, you know, I, you know, you're throwing it out to the world. I'm very thankful for all of those people for all they've done. How did you how uh, there's a couple more here but before that Madeline Stone, how did oh. your, our, our beloved friend, Madeline Stone, yeah. we love, how did those, your world and hers merge? You know, again, it was the, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure the initial um, get together. Madeline, you want to step in and tell it? Yeah, no. exactly. <laughs> well, she's probably going to be listening she's and saying, watching. why don't you say, but she's um, a big fan of our show. We appreciate it. You know, it. back in the days, music publisher, well, they still do it now. Um, but music publishers went about the business of trying to get their songwriters, mostly recording with the artists, yeah. because that was the closest way to guarantee you were going to get a song on a record with that artist, because the artist had an investment in it, um, but also to put writers together. Um, so the music publishers would talk, and they say, you know what, this, this came up on our pitch sheet, why don't we put Peter together with this person? And I don't doubt that somewhere along the line, somebody said, why don't Madeline and Peter get together? And, you know, it started a lifelong friendship as well as songwriting thing. Um, I actually, there's something very funny that we did years ago. Um, Madeline was very good friends with the late Senator Orrin Hatch. Yes. And Senator Orrin Hatch, whatever you want to say about his politics. He still, he was into was, music. He was into music and he was, he was one of the people who was um, the guy, along with one other Republican senator, um, to get the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Cooperative, all of that together. And also the Legacy Recording Act so that mm. artists who weren't seeing any money would, would start to see money. We start to see it, so, right. So Oren wrote a Hanukkah song. Now, That's right. a, he was a Mormon. 
So he writes the Hanukkah song with Madeline. Madeline hires me to produce it. So anybody has an interest, if and I'm sure you're going to Google it, but if you Google, <laughs> if you if you if you Google Senator Orrin Hatch Hanukkah song, it's you'll there. S- you'll see a video to the music track of the song at my studio, and Orrin is there. And what's really Orrin, Orrin wanted to sing on the track. So I got him in the booth with the singer we hired, Rashida, um, and Madeline, and myself, and we got two tracks of it. So one was with Oren, one was without. So he comes out, and he's, I'm talking to Oren, and Oren goes, well, where am I? I says, well, you know, Oren, we've got things panned left and right. So, you know, right now, I've got you panned to the left. You probably want me to pan you to the right, but he 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 he, he, loved, he, loved, he got a kick out of that. I was but say, again, you, you've never gone into comedy. You no. you, you know what I'm saying you have. No, no. you know maybe but, I'm getting it because I'm Long Island. You're Yonkers. Maybe there's just this thing. Yeah, well, you know, all, but it's all I can funny. Jim, all, all I can say, Jim. All I can say is, is all that, I can say is um, I didn't script it. It just sort of, you know, it just happened, it's, right? No, it, it just something's in. It's in the water. Happens. It's in the water. It just kind of happens, right? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, also, but, uh, Annie, Annie Hals, walking with Annie. Oh, Annie. Okay. So my first experience with Annie was when I was the first one of the first gigs I did with Reeve Little in nineteen seventy three seventy four was opening for Renaissance in a college thing i think it was either in brooklyn or staten island all i know is we drove down in a horrible weather six hours yeah. from boston wow and and renaissance was huge mm. they were like that that those records at that moment yeah and she was you couldn't get anywhere near them and no. her she had her own dressing room yeah so that was in 73 15 years later a song i had written uh, with a wonderful fellow named Todd Cerny, writer mm-hmm. in Nashville, may he rest in peace. <clears throat> excuse me. Called in my wildest dreams. Oh it, yeah. It was pitched to Annie, who was who had just gotten an album solo album deal with Epic Records, and uh, I was very close with Don Grierson, Michael Kaplan, who was the executive producer on that record at Epic at the time. Um, Don, we've lost as well. A wonderful record guy. Um, so Annie loved the song and one of my heroes from the Peter Gabriel albums at his own albums, Larry Fast, you know, the great uh, network records and the, the synth albums and all of the synth work that was part of Peter Gabriel's thing. That was Larry Fast. He was producing the record. So all of a sudden Annie's here in my apartment and we're writing a song together that appeared on that record called One Love. And I'm in the studio basically transferring my tracks. At that point, I could do that, you know, with the technology and, you know, recording my guitars and all of my voices. I actually did all of the background voices on In My Wildest Dreams, uh, the chorus harmonies during That's the session. That's you? Ah. That's all me doing like yeah. six parts, wow. three times for all yeah. of the parts. We didn't right. fly stuff back then. Wow. Um, and working again, working with Larry was like, crap i'm working with larry fast Lurking you know and with, yeah. annie's annie's a sweetheart i actually just spoke to her seven eight six or seven eight months ago but she's been really busy uh all of these acts are all of a sudden going on cruises they're doing these cruises you know that she's on the progressive rock cruise so, oh the cruise ships yeah the I Motown, know, I know. And, uh, it's unbelievable huh I, I know somebody invite me on a cruise i want to go on a cruise Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know. I want to have that thing around my neck where, you know, the beads, you know, it's like yes. you know, for the drinks. Right. So you can get the drinks. I get all the drinks. That's right. What right. would be your drink of choice? Oh, one, probably one of those things with those little, you know, obnoxious little umbrellas. You know? <laughs> Banana colada. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, along those you know, lines. Ex- exactly. You know, um, Andy <laughs> Fraser free. Okay. Andy Fraser. You've worked with everybody, my okay. friend. Okay. You know, the, the, it's a, Andy Fraser. When I was in high school, there was a group 
that I was I was asked to audition for. It was called Headstone. Mm-hmm. I guess it was kind of goth too. Was, <laughs> that just dawns on me. Headstone. <laughs> and the song that was monumental at uh, that was uh, was all right now mm-hmm. by Free. So um, that group disbanded, and Andy, uh, you know, Free was was always part of the A and M Records family. Um, Andy Fraser signed an own, his own solo deal and publishing deal with. A and M and Almo Irving, and that was where I was writing. So on one of these writing trips, you know, they would just say, "Here, you, you know, I played your song for this person, and they really want to write with you. Here are the directions." So I remember, you know, getting into my rental car, and this was pre GPS, pre, you know, I, you know, I'm not, you know, too sure of the Los Angeles streets and all of the sub, whatever the suburbs and the environs are. All I know is I'm driving up this twisty road. Mm. And I come across this house, like a canyon road. It or was something. like this canyon, yeah. yeah. And I meet this guy Andy, and to be honest with you, it didn't dawn on me who he was. So we spent the day writing, and it, I think Chris Thompson wound up finishing that song that we were going to work on. I was so honestly that was after three and a half weeks of this kind of insanity of writing with everybody and anybody, I couldn't couldn't do it. I was mm. like, I was tapped. And my flight was the next morning. Oh, wow. And, you know, I was about to get married. And I had all you had a lot on your plate. <laughs> yeah, right. And it, but it was all right now. <laughs> and I was free. <laughs> I know. But but the idea that, um, mm. you know, I, this is these are the songs that I grew up with. I mean, Don Covey, Chain of Fools. I remember hearing that I must have been in eighth grade. And mm-hmm. running to Sam, Sam Goody's, what did that song, what was it about that song that I, that, and the fact that he's in my living room? So, you know, I, I'm very, listen, if, if I died tomorrow, you know, bite your tongue, I, I'm a happy man. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? You, I've you, had some you, wonderful you, experiences. Oh, absolutely. And you know? still do. Uh, Tommy Nielsen. Okay, Tommy. Tommy had a number one record with this with another one of the songs I think is one of my best. It's a song called Miss My Love. Oh yeah. Um and um it was another one that got bites by a bunch of people here in the States, but Tommy took the song and this is Sweden back in the, the mid to late eighties. That's right. Still a very, very it was it wasn't anywhere near the Max Martin days right. and what Sweden has become. Um, certainly ABBA and that whole thing had mm-hmm. already had, was certainly definitely entrenched, but Tommy, um, did the song and I had, listen, I've got a gold record for that. And, you know, and, and, you know, Tommy came to Los Angeles from Sweden and I was sent out to Los Angeles to write with him. And I remember going down, I think it was Goldberg's deli, um, Pierce Southern's mansion. Ralph Pierce's mansion was right in the hills, right above, um, you know, in the hills there. And yeah. Goldberg's Deli was there, and they had a wine thing. And mm-hmm. Tommy was a wine connoisseur. So we would spend, you know, the afternoon deciding what wine and we would get. And then we would just spend the days writing and working. And again, it was just a wonderful thing. And um, Tommy recorded a bunch of other things. He actually did a duet with a song I wrote with Madeline, with an, another very, very famous artist of the time in uh, Scandinavia. Her name was Corolla, a song called Innocence is Gone. Um, and, you know, Never Say Die, these songs, some you know, always with new versions or new demos yes. can come back to life. Different arrangements and, uh, yeah, yeah, sometimes you'll have, you'll have like a smooth jazz artist take a song and turn it into their or an orchestra right. or, or choral group or whatever and do a little bit different uh, tweak on a song that, right. you know, is already uh, beloved, which is kind of cool. Have you heard that? Your songs done by other groups, orchestras, bands, whatever, and say, gee, that's kind of an interesting take on the song that I created. Well, you know, um, Secrets in the Dark it actually has four recordings. Um, only two of them are, you know, you just, again, you Google it and you say, what, what group is Alaska? 
And then there was another group fr- with the name of a of a location. So there are, are covers of the songs that aren't necessarily documented or even covered by the publishers who have the interest in the songs now. But um, that's interesting. You know, if you look online and you take your song, and I've got friends who've written some huge, you know, monster songs. If you were to just, you know, just for the lark, go and listen to the people doing their versions. I need you tonight. There's a, there's hysterical ones. Yeah. Um, the Christmas song I wrote with Shelley Pike and a dear friend. Yeah. Uh, an incredible writer. She wrote Bitch for Meredith Brooks. Yeah. What a Girl Wants, you know, um, Christina Aguilera. Um, uh, there and a whole bunch of others. But if you go on and, and we you, you hit the song, you'll yeah. hear these little school choirs or kids doing the song. Doing it, right. And, you know, it's a thrill. It's just a thrill that, you know, in any way, shape, or form, that whatever you do is somehow out there in the world and accepted. You even you know? worked with NSYNC. Christmas. Well, again, um, that's an interesting story, too, and a, and a, and a cute one. Um, the fella Vince DiGiorgio was the A&R guy at RCA BMG Records. Um, and he was in very heavily involved with that group uh, for their very first incredibly successful record. So they started doing a Christmas album. And I had written that Christmas song with Shelley back in 1992. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the, the funny story there is um, we tried to get on Vanessa, no, not Vanessa Carl, Vanessa Williams is what, Vanessa Christmas Williams. record. Oh, yeah. We missed, we missed that one. Amy Grant had a very successful Christmas record. And I actually tried to produce that song like the one of Keith something or other who produced her records. Um, but we missed her second Christmas record. So the song just sat there. Yeah. But Vince had picked up a song of mine that he had produced on an artist on his own record label back in 80, 88. So Vince's comes by and sync and is now their A&R guy. And Shelley pitches our Christmas song to him. And he says, oh, Peter Bliss, Shelley. So all of a sudden, Shelley emails me. So it has to be, at, you know, it's got to be dial up AOL. <laughs> so, you know, that dial up sound. And That's she emails. Like... Exactly. She emails me and she says, some group called Sunk, S-U-N-K is going to be our song. So I, I said to her, I says, oh, that's great. That's that, you know, that's almost as good as it going concrete. The day I was going to stunk. That doesn't sunk. sound like it's going to go too far. Exactly. Stunk. But any, anyway. She's got the N in front, right? Exactly. So anyway, um, I remember sending hilarious. a chord sheet and my and my MIDI file of my arrangement sunk. to a wonderful – to um, – Vince, who then got it to the producer, who did a wonderful job with that and many other NSYNC songs. And and one of the, the, the great stories that my daughter will always remember, I had taken her and her girlfriends, this was, she was, this was, nine, she was 11 years old. She mm. wasn't even into the boy band thing yet. Um, I'm taking them bowling and I get a phone call on my old analog phone and it's Vince saying, listen, Here's your song. And at that point, NSYNC was already huge. So, you know, the girls, my daughter and the girls are running around and I'm going, this is great. What? Yeah. So Vince calls me up and says, I have two tickets for NSYNC at the Westbury Music Fair the night before Thanksgiving. If you're in the round. Exactly. So I remember getting in the car with my daughter who, you know, what are we doing? You don't want to drive in Long Island traffic the night before Thanksgiving. Oh, no, are you kidding? They're That's all leaving right. the city. They're going right. out east. Yes. You had to see the so relatives. Yeah. I remember. So we drive down to the Westbury Music Fair, uh, and we were seeing and sync, and you know the pl- w- place was crazy. And guess who was her opening act? Britney Spears. Baby One More Time had been released all of maybe two or three weeks. First song. And I remember going out and talking to a bunch of promo people in the back. And I think I think some of them were from William Morris Agency. 
And I said, are you here for NSYNC? I says, they don't need any help. <laughs> they were like the biggest group in the world, save for the Backstreet Boys. I says, yeah. we're here for Britney. And Britney, it's interesting, Britney sang like four songs to track. Mm. She had four dancers with her. One of the dancers I recognize um, easily 10 to 15 years into her career. So she remained with Britney all of that time. And we were just, you know, who's this? And, you know, lo and behold. Uh, but those those were some interesting s days of Zamba music. Right. Which is where Madeline came from, you know, yes. as far as songwriting and Zamba Records. Because they somehow took, I'm not sure how they did it, but they somehow took NSYNC from BMG RCA in yeah. some sort of deal. Zamba got them. They already had the Backstreet Boys. Right. And uh, Aaron Carter, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, and two of my friends, you know, who I'd written with, Steve Lunt was the A and R guy, and Eric Beale uh, was the the music publisher there. Um, and of course, you know that that company got sold, and uh, again, it it all you know sort of gets absorbed into this like amoeba like thing that's the major labels and publishers now. So. It's so Interesting. cool, isn't it? Yeah, but that's how that's how the NSYNC record happened. And yeah, um, again, the song sat for six, seven years until and it it's got still, cut. It, they still, it's still on during the holidays. It's still yes. happening. You know, it's uh... and only in the world of music. Yeah, could you? Uh, Pure Southern, of course, was great in all of their foreign work. They asked me to write the English lyric and melody to a theme song for a kid's show in Brazil by an artist named Shusha, X-U-X-A. Nothing ever happened with that song in 88 or 89. But somewhere along the line, Shusha's people, Sony Brazil, heard, guess it's Christmas time. They had somebody write a Portuguese lyric to it and recorded it, and it's that's the title song of Shusha's Christmas album. So, uh oh, he's looking. Jim is looking. Here's an exclusive. Here's the exclusive. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh no! It's right next to the baby pictures. It's right next to the baby pictures. <laughs> you, you know, I think you know what I think is also great too. Your real interest in uh, children's educational yeah, yes. projects and television. And I think it's so cool. Square one. Oh, that you, was. I mean, I mean, that was that was. Now you're yes. talking our. Yes. Thing here. Yeah. My wife, my wife worked for that show. Really? And, yeah. It worked for Square One TV, actually Children's Television Workshop. And they had put this new show together and uh, they were looking for songs that the cast would sing and they wanted songs you know i we like it to sound like the beach boys and they also have special guests like the fat boys i remember doing a song for the fat boys and the judds um and bobby mcferrin uh, and they says well you know she pitched me you know she says you know peter does this and they say well yeah 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 so i play them some stuff and they said great so uh, I was asked to write a song for Bobby McFerrin to do, and it's called Wannabe. And I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find some of it, if not the whole piece. But Bobby McFerrin was, you know, was not long from uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy. So we all know the impeccable skill of him doing the padding on his chest and all of the sounds and all of the parts. So... I'm trying to mimic that in my demo of like slapping my chest, you know, uh, defibrillating myself as we go and singing the melody and one or two parts. I think I gave him maybe four tracks of what it would be. And Bobby took it and did his thing. And it was, you know, that's one of those things where you sit there and go, wow, that was cool, you know. Isn't and, it amazing? Uh, and Children's Television Workshop, so yes, legendary yes. for so many iconic Sesame yes. Street and, sure. and just so much more. You must have been like a kid in a candy store with that, huh? Well, yeah, it's interesting. Um, most of those people were academics. 
So, Actually, they are. Yeah. You know, they most and the people in the, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. So she, <laughs> no, that's not her. Now, look how they spell it. No, 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 no. That's not her. <laughs> that's the, is that the clone? No, no, no. <laughs> That's funny. It's actually X U X A. Is that Susha Santos? That's hysterical. <laughs> That's hysterical. How do you spell it? Uh, X U X A. And and understand. Oh, so they only do in the Brazil. X -X. Only yeah. in Brazil can you be a soft porn star turned into a child star. Oh my god! Really? <laughs> child star entertainment with a show. Yes. Wow. And she actually did Christmas pageants for like five years off that record. Well, I'm Literally, sure the other singer probably is very good too. And <laughs> but we'll have, to now, we'll have to check check that one out with that spelling, right? <laughs> so we'll check out we'll check out this person. That's probably okay. fantastic. And then we'll check out the one that he worked with. There you go. <laughs> that's our we move fast around here that's our show <laughs> and what were you saying about square one <laughs> well no well, i don't know but um you basically you've done it all and still do it all and you've worked with everybody even you know <laughs> well, there's got to be somebody out there still willing to hire me <laughs> well I, well <laughs> something that keeps you <laughs> i like the way you lean <laughs> so uh-oh. I like the way you back. lean back. <laughs> <laughs> you have this, and this keeps you very busy. Tell us about this. Well, yes, he is going to play something for us, I know. But just this is like a, a trip down. You know, we're like in the Smithsonian Institution of Music here on the Jim Master <laughs> Wait, Show. And I'm, but, I'm about to be put in the exhibit behind the glass. <laughs> in the exhibit with George Burns and all oh, exactly. the rest. Gum, Gumby. Gumby. And, uh, this is near and dear to your heart. Okay. Tell us about that. All right. Um, back in 2006, uh, a fellow who was renowned in New York as the guy uh, for the Songwriters Hall of Fame, Bob Leone, uh, I had yeah. done some songwriting workshops under his guidance starting in 1991 through the years. And I I built my own studio and thought, you know, maybe I'll do a recording workshop if, and I'll get in touch with Bob. Well, Bob was uh, soon to be leaving the song hall and he said, you know, this might be a position that you might be interested in. So over the course of a year and a half and interviewing with the powers that be, they hired me to become their quote unquote pro professional activities coordinator. So it was my my job to basically put together the workshop programs, uh, special events. And, um, you know, it was a wonderful, is a wonderful kind of thing, you know, celebrating songwriters and some of the most amazing songwriters of all time um, was a, was a wonderful thing. They, I wouldn't, they didn't quite end their programs in 2011, but, um, they started an affiliation with some of the major colleges here and they decided to disband what was their ground level programs for their songwriter members. So I said, let me start something because people were saying, where are we going to go? So it was not long after that I, you know, got my little LLC, New York Songwriters Collective, and we've been in operation now for 11 or 12 years. We do uh, a lot of Zoom events now pre, you know, because of the pandemic. We do a song club twice a month where writers will send me their lyrics and an MP3 or they'll play live and then we'll share it with the room on the screen, a Zoom room of maybe anywhere from five to ten people. Any more than that is too many songs to listen and get through. Yeah. Um, but we always find a way to get them into our next slot. And we go through the tunes and the idea is that throw them back and forth in that workshop phase. Um, you know, a lot of energy that goes into songwriting, not only um, the writing of it and going through all the rewrites of it and the variations, um, but also the mental energy to go through all of those variations and then also the time spent to record them and, and the money that goes into that. So if, if there's a way that you can make sure that your song is 100%, like if the song can't exist on its own, regardless of what kind of tune it is, if you can't just sing it or play it, 
right. right live, then, you know, maybe there's something that can be changed. All of these are the decisions you want to make before you commit dollars and energy, mostly psychic, emotional energy. There's something called demo love. You know, it's like when you record something and then, you know, you can't get that sound or you're looking for that sound. I can't tell you how many situations with artist friends of mine, as well as with Richard Perry saying, I want you to recreate your demo in my studio. Mm. So trying to match that can be very difficult. And sometimes you never match it. Right. You know, because there's a freeness and a, of expression. So the song clubs do that. We also have a live residency at the Bitter End here in New York City. Um, every month, the last Tuesday of every month, uh, right now we're doing live showcases where members can come up and they don't necessarily have to be great singers, but they, they each perform a song of their own. And um, it's a wonderful community that we're establishing. And we're sort of branching out a little bit more with our website. And uh, again, and and right and that guy is plays there sometimes. Yes, that was there, that there was me. Go. Okay, that was me on my 60th birthday. So uh I plan on putting the band together for my 70th. So I only have another two and a you one and a half like years. a million bucks, I tell you, really. One and a half I mean. years to go. Hmm. I still have hair. <laughs> That's it. I still got hair. You know, what it is? you know, you know what you also have, which I noticed. Uh, I'm a people person. You, uh, you've got a joy about you. There's a well, joy. There's a real. There's just a joy about you, and I'm sure well, your family, your that. friends, people you work with, get that vibe. You really love what you do. You're enjoying the ride. You appreciate it all. You know what's happened, where it's taken you what you've been able to do you've soaked it up you're still like a ch kid amazed by it all even though you're an incredible competent you know uh gold record winning professional you still are a kid at heart who's yeah, in, yes. who's mesmerized by it all and appreciates it all and reveres it all and loves it all mm -hmm. through the craziness and the ups and downs and nuttiness of it all the blood sweat and tears you you're loving the ride and that is so incredibly uh evident yeah at least that's the vibe i no, picked no, up no, no. And, well you know what born with a name like bliss uh I mean, if i was a dour kind of guy you know i don't know whether i'd be able to pull that off <laughs> good thing your last name is not blasphemy or something you know bliss no, is yeah, good i know i, I know, I know. but so you really uh no yeah. i i i feel very privileged and you know, yeah. as thankful as I am for everything, um, you know, those I, I look to those moments of self-reflection as my chill moment when yeah. I try to stop pushing myself to do more and whatever. Right. Um, you right. Know, and you've got uh, your beautiful studio, too, where you're doing a lot of the production. <laughs> <laughs> Right. He's so he's so mesmerized that we have all of this uh, material. He's just like, he's like, oh, my God, I want this guy to do my eulogy one day. <laughs> Wait a I, second. Believe it or not, I've actually done five for relatives. Uh, oh, I have relatives God. who've actually who are still with us, who've put oh. orders in for me to do their eulogies down the line. I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to live to 200. Don't even tell me you want me to do your eulogy. But there's a list of people that are, they've already ordered me. That's that, well, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. You know, listen, not only are you good at gravesite, but at the Shiva, you're going to have them in the stitches. <laughs> 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 so that's it. I, tell I know, I that's know, but you're gonna have to come up with some new material for those seven days. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> now we have something here. I think we have a little clip that okay. uh, was sent along. It's like the open house clip. Um, let's take a look at that, and we'll, we'll mention it when we come back. Here it is. Oh, the New York Songwriters Collective is all about raising the level of your songwriting craft and helping you navigate the ever-evolving music industry of today and tomorrow. 
Our online song clubs on Zoom are a perfect way to get feedback and improve your song as you learn song crafting techniques along the way. Our monthly residency at New York City's Greenwich Village Historic Club, The Bitter End, is where our members get to perform in our collective member showcases. We host many other live events like Writers in the Round and music-related book launches. Our monthly free-to-all open house on Zoom is a place where all may join to ask questions and seek advice on everything songwriting. This includes music, lyrics, recording, mixing, mastering, recording software like Pro Tools, Logic, and Ableton, computers, copyright, publishing, the PROs, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, royalties, song distribution, and sound exchange. The Collective is here to answer all your questions. The Collective website is a social network where members can create their own profile page and add their music, video, and post events. Your membership, creative input, and opinions matter. Let the New York Songwriters Collective become a place of support for you in your craft and career. Very wow. nice. Oh, Very thank nice. you for doing that. I try to put on my best narration voice. You did a nice job. I and don't it, really have a great. Can I hire you? <laughs> absolutely, I do. Now I voice over work. Many years of radio. Um, <clears throat> that that the music was that like production sort of music you created for that. Actually, that was just a quick little demo track of a song um, that I just threw together, oh, and good. I just looped it. Just oh, loop in front of it. It's wound up being done in a whole different style. Fantastic. But, but I figured, let me use it. What the so heck? The, the YouTube <laughs> algorithms won't give us a copyright claim. <laughs> well, you know. They're, they're very good at doing that. <laughs> if I put up my own songs I've written, yes. they'll take them down. And then yes. I have to, Isn't and that then I have to go to YouTube and, I, to them and, and to I say, the, listen. You to know, the distributors. Uh, yeah, I wrote the song. <laughs> it's fine. I am Mr. Bliss. Uh, yeah, the dis it's the distributors themselves that distribute the music. Uh, yeah. that do the whole and we've had to, we've learned all that uh, three years yeah. ago. We've learned it. Uh, what oh, people send, sure. send stuff and then you know you get it cleared and all. Um, looks like you have something beautiful in your hand. You're gonna uh, treat us to something, uh, my well, friend. You, you say that people like to hear something live. So yes, um, they do. Can you hear that? We can hear it. <laughs> it sounds very good, too. It's plugged into the board. So, so anyway. That's why it sounds really, really nice. Right. And, and how's the voice? Is that in a balance with the guitar, kind of? Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. Right. Well, yes. I'm and you, don't, you... you don't need a throat lozenge or anything. Well... <laughs> Actually, I, I could. I, I got a gummy bear waiting. <laughs> um, but I figured um, when you go and you listen to the Streisand version of my song Emotion, um, that is not anywhere near, you know, it might have started and the rhythm and the tempo is exactly where my demo was. But, um, you know, this the vision is, was different. The, this is a, it was essentially like an R&B tune. So I'm going to just give you a little shot of what it was. Um, so this and is... this is actually five keys down from where I originally did it. So, so before you do it, we, we have yeah. to show the favorite graphic of yours. This oh, is no. an AMS exclusive. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's the JSM, JMS exclusive. <laughs> now, show us that beautiful... He loves that. He loves that JMS exclusive. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Look at that. <laughs> oh oh this is the levity part, folks. Love, <laughs> levity. This is the levity. We, we always, always talk about. You're not going to find levity. this anywhere else but the Gym Masters show. Nowhere else. <laughs> Everybody else does interviews. We do conversations. We have fun like a talk show. Uh, tell us what the beautiful, <laughs> the beautiful instrument that is in your hands. This is a Gibson J45. It's probably, it's wow, it's 15 years old now. 15 years old now. And it's actually turning into my favorite And it sounds like uh, the authorities are coming back to confiscate it. <laughs> oh. You, See, didn't make, you didn't make that last payment, huh? You should see what my electric bill is, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Hey, what are you cooking in here? <laughs> Uncle Joey's not around to help with that anymore. No, I know. <laughs> I wish. I wish. That's it. But uh, yeah, actually, this is my favorite guitar now. But I figured I'd give you a verse and a chorus of emotion if I can croak it out. Because I really haven't great. sung yet, but we'll give it yeah. a shot. Yeah, How's I that? would love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, for a lark, if everybody wants to just Google or YouTube <laughs> Barbara Streisand Emotion, you can you'll hear see, the subtle difference. Right. You'll compare it. And you'll also be able to see Barbara doing her best boy George. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, this is like, this was like MTV generation um, over the top, kind of wow. crazy. Roger Daltrey's the love interest. Wow. Uh, it was pretty crazy. That's incredible. And there's actually, they made, a, they made a video about making the video. That's what happens these Isn't days, that right? It's it incredible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for those uh, joining us, Emotion is a song uh, sung by the incomparable Barbara Streisand, and he's going to give us a little bit of a tweak of what it was like before Barbara took it and made it her own. Um, there he is. in the mirror looks the same Every morning I keep looking for a change Sometimes I wonder Am I standing still in time? Ooh, I'm tired of doing everything the same old way I'm tired of playing all the games that people play This running round in circles Gives me no peace of mind I'll need to find Lead the emotion I need to laugh sometimes I need to cry Ooh, yeah I need the emotion I need to feel each passing day go by Ooh, yeah I need the emotion I need to love so hard, I don't know what to do. Baby, I need you. Wow. So that was sort of what it was. Would you ever release that with you doing it? Well, you know what? Um, I'm starting to Great. go Great. Sounds terrific. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, I invite all of you to go Google Peter Bliss. Don't go past page six. That's the arrest record. Um, and you'll find videos, uh, you know, of me doing the song at the bitter end, much, much when I was 60, much like I had written it. Um, and I'm starting to release my own tunes now. Uh, again, I think that's part of the whole thing of, you know, I've done this, I've done that. I've spent a lot of time working with others for others. And now I, I, I'm trying to devote a certain amount of time to putting my own music out again. Say it's I like the second what you just record said. I never did. You know? You've spent so much of your life doing things for others, and now it's Peter's time, which I think resonates with a lot of people, especially now with what we've experienced the last few years. There's been a lot of people that have been saying – uh, they've been leaving jobs, moving things around in right. their life, looking sure. at next chapter after this pandemic. And they've been saying, you know, I've always been serving this and that and them and those and they and whatever. How about me? And a lot of people are wanting to do things yeah. that inspire and connect and lift. And so you're in this sweet spot where you've done all of the things, you know, that uh, serve the greater good and continue to do that. But there's things that you, there's a voice you have, there's a message you have, there's a vision you have that you want to do uh, as Peter Bliss yourself, which I think is a beautiful thing. You know, yeah. during the course of the last couple of years, um, you know, with the downtime, the reflective yeah. time, looking at next chapter, how have you experienced that? How, you know, how has Peter Bliss changed through what we've experienced that's an interest that's an interesting question um what i do remember uh i was in nashville for a good three four week writing recording session in february of 2020 um i drove back 
in my Subaru into New York City two days before Mario Cuomo shut the entire state down. Uh, I was locked out of my studio at the time. Um, I couldn't get even get back in there to even get my equipment out for two months past that. But everything sort of, everybody was trying to figure out what they were doing. I Mario was honest, Cuomo? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Not a, he listen. came back from, he, <laughs> right. he, he was right. risen. That I, happened I, on Easter. He was risen. I bet you have a, <laughs> I bet you, there's a Jim Masters <laughs> exclusive in that. But um, so go. anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway. Mario, um, is that you, Mario? That's right. He was he was our fearless leader for a while. He was actually yeah. getting high marks for how he was handling things in New York, as compared to the way it was being handled in the rest of yes. the country. Oh, but, I know. Yeah, I know. Mario was the father. <laughs> he was yeah. the governor in the eighties, and the. You're, I mean, and, you mean Andrew? Yeah, oh yeah. And and of course there was Chris on CNN, but uh, but the one thing I I do remember <laughs> about that time you are hilarious, Mr. <laughs> Bliss. Mr. Masters and Mr. Bliss are going to go on the road. Okay, but who's MS exclusive? We're going to go on the road. We need a straight man. We need a straight man though. Who's got? We got to decide what's going to happen here. You know, we got to decide this. We got to do that. You know. Yes, <laughs> but. But I do. Luana I mean, Sandoval is here. She says, "I love your song, Emotion." Oh well, thank you so much. Yes, I just made point oh 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 five cents, Did which you? means that I can get I can get like a quarter of a French fry in a McDonald's <laughs> a dollar menu French fry. Pack. Amazing how that is, right? People don't realize. They think Amazing. that you are going to get. You know, <laughs> you know. just got twenty grand, right? No, yeah. it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, so, I think, honestly, I think everybody's gone through a, a good deal of reflection. Yes. You know, and you know what? Listen, in the rarefied world of being a creative, that's always been difficult. You know, rejection. I think, I think one of the things that was comforting and at the same time discomforting, um, there's a level of drama and high sense of reality, a heightened sense of reality whenever you write or when you're in this industry and you consistently throw your work out to be loved, hated, rejected, critiqued. And even the idea that something like some of the things that successful writers, you have something happen and it's like you get almost addicted to that. You know, I've never really had a nine to five job and I don't know what it's like to Go, get up, go to work, come home, turn off the head, watch some TV, go to bed, you know, watch football on the weekends. Uh, my brain has never worked that way. So I don't know whether I would miss that. But, you know, that's just like every other field. When people retire or they, you know, or, they, or they're forced into retirement, what do they do? You know, the last thing anybody wants their spouse or partner to do is come home after they've been active, you know, because you yeah. get your sense of importance yeah, and vitality true. from a lot of that. So the connections with people exactly and right. uh, no matter what the technology advancements and all these things bring, you still need that human connection. You still need to go to the diner and have a bowl of soup and laugh and talk miss, and yes. All of that and, and and kind. We talk a lot about it. I always have, uh, even off the air and not in my professional TV radio world. Mm -hmm. Empathy, kindness, yeah. listening, not right. always speaking, enjoying, enjoying music and the arts and and nature. And I'm an ocean person. Growing up on Long Island, the ocean there, yeah. and we're here along the coasts as well. Here, uh, same thing. There's so many things like what we've talked about tonight and the, and the music and everything that makes you feel good. It evokes yeah. so many different memories, so many different uh, emotions and <clears throat> releases the endorphins and so many different levels. Music like humor, which we have both shared with our audience <laughs> today, is very leveling, ice breaking, unifying and right. healing on mm -hmm. so many levels, yes. isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And honestly, song, you know, music and songs in my guitar have has been my refuge from yes. when I was little. 
I mean, yeah. I was the original hyperactive kid before they knew what that was. My mom went to the doctor, said my son is driving me crazy, my middle one, gave her tranquilizers for me, which only set me through the roof. It was almost as if it was a space shot through the roof. It was had the opposite effect, which is yeah. common for, you know, Adderall and all that. So whatever that is or it isn't. Did they give her the tranquilizers too to they actually deal gave with her? <laughs> it, was the, it was like my mother's little helper, the Rolling Stones. They yes. gave her uppers. They gave her, um, you know, better, you know, dexedrine. There was a lot of that sort of here. Yeah. Just take this and uh, yeah, make you feel better. Chemicals, the wave in the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's you right. Those TV dinners. <laughs> well, we don't want to. I can read, read the ingredients of those TV dinners we had. Oh, Ronald that chocolate, chocolate yeah. pudding. Uh, oh, please. Oh, that's funny. Hey, I want the one with the brownie. I don't want the one with the fruit compote. <laughs> the Swanson TV dinners. I want the one with the brownie in it. And they had Libby's that had the <laughs> cartoons on the back or whatever. And, and who came up with the word compote? <laughs> I love words that not sort somebody of just... from not somebody from Yonkers <laughs> came up with compote. We're going to call that fruit compote. That way we can charge 75 cents more for that TV dinner because we're using the word compote, <laughs> which is very close to the word compost. That's right. Have you noticed that? Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and he doesn't could... want the fruit compost. That's right. And of course, asking mom, buy Tang. Jack. It's the orange right. juice of the astronauts. The astronauts, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know? it's a, it's really amazing, right? It's it's a little dabble, do you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I buy my Marlboros because of the guy riding the horse on TV. Hey, you grew up in a household of Jingle Land and ad slogan. It's perfect, right? Oh, the so you the were best thing. My dad sometimes wouldn't get paid by some of the clients, really? so they'd send him product. Uh, okay, so he yes. had a South African frozen lobster tail account. So on <laughs> Wednesday nights, we would sit How did in he a get that account? Don't even ask. <laughs> My dad was into convenience food and frozen foods. I didn't have real potatoes except on Thanksgiving. We had those potato buds. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Peter Cots. <laughs> yeah, those little potato buds, right. But so every Wednesday night for like a good six months, we had all of us would sit in front of the TV set with little trays of lobster tails and butter sauce. Yes. We that liked, must have been. Like, you were living every large in Yonkers. You were living yes, large in Yonkers. The neighbors. You were the talk of the town in Yonkers, those neighbors. <laughs> They're having lobster tonight. <laughs> yes. Your kids, your your the uh, the offspring in the field as well. My daughter is a chef. Uh, it's funny. She even says, "Dad, you're like me. You knew what you wanted to do when if you didn't have to Early. go to college to figure it." So she yeah. wound up going to the French Culinary Institute here in New York. Wonderful. I let her stay in the apartment with her roommate. She painted it black. <laughs> It took five coats of primer to get it back to this. Uh, yes. So she had her experience in New York with her roommate and friend. And I'm now, you know, the wonderful, you know, grandfather of two beautiful, uh, you know, a, beautiful. a grandson and daughter who I'm going to visit soon. So um, they're in the yeah. tri-state area, uh, Portland, Oregon. Oh, Portland. So you're going to go head down to um, uh, head down to Portland, uh, Oregon. Yeah. That's going to be beautiful. Yes. Well, let yes. your daughter know we had a friend of mine that I've interviewed for a long time on PBS who came on only about a week ago. Jacques Pepin, the oh, legendary sure, of course. Chef. Was she worked stunning. in the she worked with him. Actually, was his He's assistant. Such a nice guy. They were it was that training. Honestly, that's that oh, school and that yes. location isn't there anymore. Right. But I remember they, they had a restaurant called Le Collet, which yes. is the, school, the restaurant is part of the school. Right. And we would all go down and they would do it. And so she's working in the kitchen and they actually loved my daughter's skill and just sense of whatever that yeah. they hired her for like six, seven months to be assistants. Wow. You know, so she Such was working with Jacques. Small world. Yeah. And then she he lives in Connecticut. In... He's on the Connecticut coast. Yes. And he's Michelle. got a wonderful channel. He's on PBS. Yeah. 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 For years, yes. with Julia Child. And I interviewed him multiple yeah. times and he just came on about a week ago. Yeah. I said, hey, you want to pop on? And he popped on and we That's talked about great. his whole life That's and great. career. And 
So you should appreciate that. But that's great. Uh, you're loving, you're loving it all, huh? What are some of the additional blessings and joys in your life, my friend? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I grew up and you live, you were the kid that lived across the street from me or something. I just feel like <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. Well, well you know, you're, you see, I love people. Is it a New York thing or? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I mean, I truly love people. I love yeah. the contact. Um, but Me I'm also, too. it's very interesting that there, there's a d d duality. Uh, I'm also very private. Like this is enough interaction that I need for two days. You're good. Days. You're going to be wiped out. Don't no, call no, no, no. him or anything because he's, <laughs> his state's going to be down. He's don't answer, don't expect any texts or anything. He's going to, yeah. he needs to recover from but there are the days, baby pictures. <laughs> yeah. But other than going to the gym right down the street, there are days when I don't talk. I Do you know there are Days, days when I don't, too, don't speak believe it to or not. Someone. Right. Yeah. There are days where it, it's funny and people don't expect that. Right. They don't from you because you're no, so no, no. communicative. And and there are days, too, where I don't mind instead of being the host, being the guest. Yeah. I don't mind just relaxing and doing our thing, whatever it is. Nothing is planned. Nothing is scripted. Nothing is. And whatever it is, nothing, there's no time. The clock is not, we're not up against the clock. Right. And I think it's because we're in these industries where we usually are with all of this, but, yeah. and, and you're just like, whatever it is, I just want to have a sandwich and, you know, right. and you don't have to say a lot. You're, you're, those days right. you're listening more, you're, you're listening and absorbing it all. And, and sometimes people will then say, are you feeling okay? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, well, I'm some, okay. I'm just, listening. if somebody calls me and they say, did I wake you? I said, no, you're just the first person I'm talking to you, to you today. And no, I don't want an extended warranty. on the automobile. <laughs> right. And kidding. you don't have to pay off the college, right? I know. <laughs> but, 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 but honestly, honestly, um, I, I'm an intense dude. I may not come across that way and maybe people may because, but I'm an intense dude. Yeah, Sometimes I have trouble living with doing. trouble living with myself. So, but that's all, Which you know what? I've accepted all that that is part all part of, the, of my yes. thing. So that's how right. you've been able to do the things you've been able to do. You need that sort of uniqueness insanity. and energy and perspective. Insanity. You need the insanity <laughs> to put up with it all. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, it's all, it's a crazy world uh, on so many different levels. But yeah. but you work through it uh, oh, yeah, by sharing the creativity. You know what I mean? I get it out of my system. Uh, I get it out of my system. The music Were you considered a prodigy as a child? <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, like, here's another JMS exclusive. <laughs> it was prodigy as a child. We're announcing no. that for the first no. time here. Uncle Joe said so. <laughs> in Yonkers. No. <laughs> because I just, I didn't want to follow a script. I didn't want to follow any set Particular course. pattern. Right. Uh, the, you know, honestly, and I don't mean, yeah, I don't no, mean this yeah. in a derogatory oh, way it's, it's, towards had Berkeley, own. towards Berkeley. But I remember when I enrolled in Berkeley, when the rec, when the publishing thing and the record thing, when I was 17, 18 didn't happen. Um, and even though, even before I had gotten into the situation that kept me from going to Berkeley, they says, why do you want to go to Berkeley? All you're going to do is to teach you how to play fast and, and you're going to sound like everybody else there. And I took that in and that's not Berkeley today for sure. Um, but Berkeley was a very, very uh, conservative, oh, you know, yeah. reli had a religious backing. You couldn't bring a girl a... into that dorm. That's why they could play their scale so fast. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> I got to hold on to something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> a reason why. Uh, yeah. <laughs> am I am I allowed? Am well, I allowed? Wait a minute! Did you, did you get in the car and go to the Berkeley in California instead of the one in Boston? Is that what happened? Oh, that went to the wrong zip code. That would have been the wrong zip code. All I know is, after all of this, do I get final approval on the final cut? I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
No, you don't. But no, you Mr. don't. <laughs> Mini me does. Mini me does. Oh my lord! He's telling me he absolutely loved this conversation. I tell you, <laughs> Mister Mister Lovety here, and your your Gumby. My Gumby, I know. You always have the Gumby near you, huh? Yes, I also have Isn't this. Cool? This Ooh, I also that? have this. Ooh. This guy. Well, hold on a second. This guy sits on my microphone screen, so whenever we sing or I sing, I've got the little guy saying, "You just do your thing and don't think about it." So, you know. Um, it's all it's all good. It's all good, Jim. See, that's so cool, right? So he's sort of like, uh, you know, he's a source of inspiration for you on many different levels. You know, that's wonderful. It's 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 almost you know also that's because for... you started with Buddha, so it's all full circle. Well, See? here we go. <laughs> oh, Buddha, Buddha Records, and now look what we got. Oh yes, yeah, see, yeah. So I've got. You know what? I'm in my playpen with my toys. Well, you know, you know who's really loving it is Gilligan. <laughs> <laughs> Dream of Denver, Bob Denver's wife. Aloha, Dream of Denver. <laughs> Aloha, Jim. Gilligan loved it. And you I know who love else it. loved it? <laughs> Gilligan's buddy, as I mentioned earlier, Mayor Goldie Wilson, actor Don Fullalove. Oh, from great. Back to the Future. That's great. Are, are you, do you know Bud Mishkin? at all you know bud he's a uh, uh, a dear friend um, i haven't met no yeah yeah he he you know he he's a, a new york personality and he's been doing a bunch of sure. things you know podcasts as well but um you know he's he you know, he, the way you engage is similar you know a very open you know warm guy you know but that's uh, the only way to do it that's that's the um it's who I am. It's what I know. A lot of people, you know, like when you, if you were to meet me, you know, at Home Depot on a Sunday or something, what wow. you'd get that version of me yeah. is the same version you're getting now. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, there's certain areas in this industry where you, you have to form into like news or whatever, which I've yeah. done as well, where you have to go into a certain other type of delivery and blah, blah, blah. But this is, uh, this is me as me, and this is you as you. And that's what I think is what makes these conversations special and unique because we're, we're both having a good time exactly. nothing is scripted. There's no pre-planned questions, no teleprompters. No, no. And we're just uh, sharing nuggets of uh, life. You know what I mean? Which I think and is beautiful. If I find, I, where are you located? Are you, do you, are you allowed to say where you reside? I'm somewhere in the New York area along the Southern New England coast between New York and Boston. Oh, okay. So, but, but I will. Someday we'll share a crab plate. <laughs> we'll share a clam plate somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll share a crab plate somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, on the coast somewhere. <laughs> on the coast somewhere. <laughs> and you're in that same sort of area, too, sure. in, in New York, yeah. right? I'm, in, I'm mostly in, uh, on, on, you know, the New York and North New England guy. You know? I never, <laughs> I never, I never, I never exactly. Between, he's somewhere between Staten Island and Bangor, Maine. <laughs> is, is Staten Island part of New York City? I think that's part of New Jersey, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. It's, just, it's kind of feeling like it's more like it's next to Tennessee at this point. <laughs> but anyway, uh-oh. You're going to get a bunch of hate mail from Staten oh, Island. <laughs> we love Staten Island, right? We love, anyway, we love everybody. Love this, it. Love it on the Gym Master Show. Well, this, this has been great, Jim. Thank you. My pleasure. And of course, we love our dear Madeline, right? Yes, well, maybe that's yes. what we can do. We can get together with Madeline and all go out to eat or something. We or can, yeah, we can all write a city. song together. Yes. Write a song together yes. and, you know, out go out to eat in, the, in Manhattan or something. Yes. We should do that. You know, yeah. let's uh, see if we can put that all together with Madeline and all. That'd be That's so cool. Great. That'd be great. And to all of the people who've been, I see the little comments the, going the, by. The love it I yeah. said, thank you so much for watching and listening. And uh, I hope I hope we entertained you. Oh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. On many different levels. And they already called you a love it So I say, you know, there's Grammys. Right. There's Grammy Awards, there's Tonys, Oscars, Peabody's, Tellies, all these great, you know, awards that you can get, Emmys, 
But yeah. how does it feel to be told you're a lovity on the Gym Masters show live? Are your feet tingling? That's what most guests say is happening. Their feet tingle. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get my one guest. Out of one guest said they. <laughs> one guest said they started levitating. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Here's another exclusive. His underwear is still in the dryer, and he has to get it out. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't laugh. <laughs> because it's, it's well, true. by now, after two hours and 20 minutes, that underwear has shrunk. <laughs> yeah. I hope Peter's doing okay. He does his now own a, laundry. It's now, a pocket, <laughs> it's now a pocket square. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh my it's, gosh. It's this whole thing here. Right. This is something. Oh my God. This is something. Yeah. Jane, you mentioned uh, Nielsen. Uh, Jane's from Sweden. So she was loving when you were mentioning oh. Tommy. Yeah. She watches from Sweden and Merlin watches from Canada and That's Sherry good. watches from Kansas, USA. That's and uh, yeah, I mean, there, and Kathleen is in New York City and, cool. and all, all the others watching from around the world. We thank them and we thank you, Mr. Bliss. This was blissful and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it really on, on so many different levels. This was truly a treat and I knew it would be. And uh, we even have the, you know, you need a microscope probably to see it, but there's the discography. I mean, this is just some of the iconic you know songs that you hear every day, <sighs> folks, that he is responsible for. He's humble. He's not going to show this list. But we are because showing this list makes it a JMS exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, and, and it was funny when you asked me to send you all of that stuff. Some of the things that are, are woefully on the list of the honeydew list on the fridge is update my website, my artist website. I just finished doing the New York Songwriters Collective website. Um, there's a lot of left brain, right brain thing going on, you know, and there's that vortex in the middle where the two hemispheres meet. It's the vortex that'll always get you. That's the that's what's going to get you. It's, it's the really, vortex. It's been a pleasure, Jim. Thank you, you know, so I, I, as I say to everybody, we'll keep the porch light on for you. Hopefully right. we'll break bread soon. I hope this show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me and that's all of us great, as much Jim. as I have with you. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. Are you kidding? It was absolutely awesome. You entertained us. We had a and, great conversation. You played music. Hey. And you know what? Now I don't need to create my time capsule on some of the things I did. Because I don't, I never want to write a book. I mean, just watch this episode of the Gym Master Shows. Thank live, you very so. much. Thank it's you all, very much. It's all here. So, so you do do wakes and funerals and stuff. And, and eulogies. Does it mean you're great? I do do what? <laughs> you, you, you do you you do you do eulogies. You said. Well, I I've had I've done probably about five for relatives okay. through the years. Yes, and yeah, okay. uh, it's something. You know, I, it sounds crazy, but it's when it's somebody that you care about and you really yeah, love, and right. they meant so much to you. It's and you probably will understand this. It. It's something that I don't do for the glory of it. It's something that takes over me yeah. and I'm propelled by myself, not by yeah. other people. I have to do it. I have to tell their story. I have to share who they were. We, I do videos with the music that, you know, knocks sure. everybody out and just it's something that I have to do as part of closure for everybody right. and for me, but also to celebrate this individual who meant so much to all of us who happened to be here gathering in their name. And um, it, it's just something that is an automatic for me. I don't even raise my hand to do it. It's just something that I have to do, need to do to celebrate yeah. the person and, and share their life uh, in a deep feeling way and there's times i've done it where then we've also shown a, a video with the music mm -hmm. and and instrumental music and all kinds of different things where you know there was one for an aunt where for like 10 minutes everybody just 
sat in the seats in the pews mm -hmm. nobody got up the, even the and you know the the minister didn't rise to do his continuation right, even sure. he didn't lift up because they were so it sort of summarized the life and they were feeling it yeah. they were and you can hear the the sounds of the response um and it was uh it was something really amazing and that's, that's it's you know well you know we've all we've all lost certainly you know we've I mean in the we, Wayne shorter yesterday uh the news came out that we lost Wayne shorter a day or two ago Jeff Beck um a lot of the people who you know Burt we know, love we work at Burt Backrack you know and again listen Burt was what 90 Three ninety four and yes, I mean, so and a friend of mine a year ago, we just hit the one year anniversary. Uh, yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie Spector, so oh, friend, of course. your family friend, yeah, you know, so it's like, um, listen, it's a part of life, yeah. but I think it's also uh, we're losing a, a generation now. Um, you know, I mean, I, I live right around the corner from the Dakota, I was, you know, here when you know we lost John. And that's what already 40 years ago so you know yeah was it 89 i was su i sucked at math <laughs> no i actually was good at math but the it was bc is, it used to be before christ now bc means before COVID. <laughs> yeah i know but um so i think i think we're sort of seeing you know a generation go uh, at the same time we're seeing um the 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 technology span into a whole nother realm. Um, Artificial intelligence. And, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I think we're all, you know, again, certainly people my age or in any age, but it's certainly certain businesses create creative business. Um, I know we should wrap up, but they're going they're, through a transition of how to transition. deal with it and how do we, how does someone from my generation or ilk accept the fact that they're going to sample all of my songs and melodies or or somebody else's and then generate and the fact is the whole legal the copyright they just i think the copyright you know board just basically says we're not going to accept a copyright of an of an ai composition i mean so all along the way with digital and all of the different forms of music and how we've expressed them napster was 2000 yeah you know and that you know so all of this music hasn't changed how we deliver it how we hear it how we experience it you know um that's changing but yeah you know if we just go back to the heart of what it was that made us smile or cry or whatever um i think that's how we go into the good night of if accepting that what we know and what's coming it's like when my father took me to see Jimi Hendrix when I was 13. He thought he was, he was in World War II. He says, what the fuck is this guy doing? Excuse my ledge. You know, he's playing with his yeah. teeth. Yeah. He's doing this, he's doing right. that. This right. is a kid's show. Right. But, it's, so, it's, it's not Benny Goodman. No, yeah. no, it ain't Benny Goodman. So, you know, again, rap. Rap is a culture. Rap, that whole, that is, and, I, and I'm friendly with some of the people who started that you know, and we're on the... Didn't um, that sort of come out of elements of jazz? You know, I honestly, I don't know. But I do know that um, it, 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 a lot of it was New York centered. Yeah. I mean, you know, I could go through all of the names and the people. Run D. Exactly. That was Profile Records. Uh, Corey Robbins, who was this young kid up at MCA Music. Um, that's Run DMC. Uh, my friend Freddie Mineo, Select Records, um, was Roxanne, Roxanne Shanty. And that started a whole empire for his label. Um, so, and I remember when Freddie says, I, I, you have to press records, and they're in stack in his, there wasn't any room for him because you had to press at least X number of records and he couldn't sell them. And then all of a sudden, explosion. Explosion, explosion. right. So, yeah. you know what? But that's, there's always going to be a next thing. It's I do miss Tower next. Records. I used to spend oh. hours in Tower Records listening, sampling with the headphones. I know I used to go to several locations yes. and when they had the out of business sale, I literally went to 
I think I might have even gone up to Yonkers. I mean, I went up to right. all of them in the tri-state area right. digging and it was just well you think about the experience uh, certain yes. experiences are going away yes uh you know i was as we were talking before we went on the air i was two i was 14 when woodstock happened i wasn't going there um but i remember in 2000 i think it was 2008 that my daughter, I'm standing on line at the Jefferson Valley Mall in Upper Westchester County, Yorkton, um, online to get the very first iPhone for her. And you think about how the world's changed in all of that time. Now they're up to, I, what, 750 now? <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have the original. I still actually have the original, original phone, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I have a couple of friends who still have Blackberries. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it had the little typewriters on it. How do you yeah. do that? Do right. you do that? It, it, now when you look at it, right? Exactly. It's like, how do you do? It's it's a whole other thing. A lot of patience. It takes a lot of patience to I do know. that. Well, you're a, you're a cool cat. This well, was really awesome, Peter. And I hope we do get together at some point and have please the crabs and the clams yes. and yes. and all the rest. You are welcome back anytime. And please do definitely spread the word about the Gym Master I Show Live series. Absolutely. If you know other folks you think would like to hop on, you know. Sure. Absolutely. We sometimes yes. we'll do a show that's a half hour, hour, yeah. you know, however long the guest has, right. you know, we're very cognizant of that. And sometimes we just let it roll. And uh, and this was absolutely awesome, my friend. I really, well, really thanks enjoyed so much it. for the invitation, Jim. You are very welcome. You, you stay well welcome. and healthy, and to everybody out there as well. Stay well, healthy, yeah. and uh, take good care. Absolutely. This has been a JMS exclusive. <laughs> and I'm going to go get my laundry out of the dryer now. I'm going to get that laundry. <laughs> I hope you put a fabric sheet in there, bounce or something. You don't want any static cling. Remember, any... ring right. around the collar, whisk. Yeah, you know, there's all these on YouTube. There's all these like <laughs> commercials from back then that I'm watching. And it, it, that the jingle, ring around the collar, like all the neighbors would talk if they found out you had ring around your collar. You better buy whisk. <laughs> <laughs> no your dad would love all of these stories my dad <laughs> I, I was a part of some of these stories. of these stories i'm sure he didn't have ring around the collar ever <laughs> that's, right. That, that's right you be well my friend peter all bliss right. in the house on the gym master show live we'll keep the porch light on you're welcome back anytime my friend and thanks a thoroughly lot. enjoyed this and i hope you did as well i did have a good one take all right care. You, you take care cheers now bye <laughs> Wow, that was a lot of fun, was it not, gang? Boy, we had a hoot of a time. We just let it roll, you know. Uh, why stop? Why, why stop? Why put a time limit on it? Sometimes when you have such great conversations like that, you just let it roll. And it is kind of like he and I, you know, grew up across the street from each other or something, right? You know, in so many different levels, just the way sometimes you just click. You know what I mean? He's amazing. He's a lot of fun. He really, my father and my folks and family have always said, Jim, you should have gone into comedy. And, and I understand that. <laughs> yeah. I think levity is so important in life, but so is uh, also the levity, right? The love too. And uh, he has certainly shared a lot of that with his, uh, with his music and his uh, wit and wisdom and his prowess. He's just really so good at what he does. We're talking about Peter bliss in the house and, um, Really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. As we mentioned, or if you just joined us late, this is a, an episode you definitely would like to uh, see again in its entirety because we it was chock full of great nuggets, and, you know, music history on so many different levels, so many iconic uh, songs and stories with um, some of your favorite stars and so much more that we talked about that, um, that Peter has been involved in and has you know his stamp is uh intact his legend is there some of the iconic people that he has worked with over the years even menudo i mean come on from the, the osmonds to menudo i mean that is what you call versatility barbara streisand abdul in sync you know, Andy, of course, and Rick and Don and Dan. And it's just really amazing. Um, and of course, there, 
Yeah, which was cool. Cool story about that. Amazing story, too. He was very open about that. And of course, this as well. And there's that iconic discography, but there's there's many more uh, that aren't even on that list. There's the guitars up close and personal, his own studios that he has in New York as well, where a lot of production is done. Uh, he does a lot of production for others. He does corporate. He does so many different things. And uh, you got a chance to learn about somebody behind the scenes a little bit where, you know, a lot of the record producers and the labels and other art artists have always known who he is. He is a great singer songwriter himself, but the industry knows a lot of what he's contributed to it. And, um, and now you know a little bit more about some of these songs, these iconic songs and the person behind many of them as well. Peter Bliss, singer, songwriter, and renowned uh, music producer stopping by the Jim Master Show live series. And we had such a good time. Uh, Merlin says, Peter, if you're watching, go fold your laundry. <laughs> He's going to. I'm sure he will. He'll be singing. He'll be whistling as he works. Uh, awesome show tonight. Thank you, Merlin. Appreciate that as well. Watching in Canada. I'm headed to Canada in just a couple of weeks, uh, Merlin. We're going on two multi-day television projects in my professional world and TV. And we're headed up to Canada for an extended um, experience uh, in two of your cities there in Canada with the TV crew. Kathleen in New York City says, have a great night, Jim. Love it. hugs you as well, Kathleen in New York City. And everybody that's watching from all around the world, uh, Sherry Larson in Kansas, uh, USA. Thank you, Jim, for another wonderful show. Thank you for all you do for your loveties, the Jameis loveties. Thank you very much as well. We had an awesome time. We love it. Yeah, we're headed there and a couple of other places as well, Merlin. Yeah, we are going to be very busy with the crew uh, in Canada. We thank Peter Bliss for joining us here on the show again it was a blissful time uh renowned music producer yes but prolific singer and songwriter and so much more i do want to let you know uh very excited as well we have extraordinary guests coming up even this weekend laura purcell her father bill purcell a legendary composer and conductor uh he passed of covid recently and laura who's an extraordinary singer actress, writer, and also on an award-winning figure skater. Laura is going to be on our show and she's going to be sharing some wonderful music with us and some fabulous stories tomorrow, uh, celebrating her dad, Bill, who was again, a legendary composer of a lot of incredible music, originally from Nashville. Laura will be joining us tomorrow from Nashville, Tennessee, at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, exclusively on the show. Then on Sunday, Keith Brewer is with us, and Keith has worked with some of the greats in the industry. He also used to host a show behind the music on VH1, and uh, he's been in the Ravens and Barley Juice and a lot of incredible, uh, incredible bands. He is a Celtic rock icon singer, songwriter, and he's going to be with us on Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is going to be fantastic, 11 a.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. in Ireland. On Monday, very popular actor Christos Andrews is going to be with us. Um, he is on that iconic series, The Bay, that everybody loves right now, and he's been on soap operas and everything else. Emmy winning. He is the youngest person ever under the age of 30 to have won 11 Emmy Awards, 11 under the age of 30 for acting, producing, and directing, 11 he has garnered. He's going to be with us on Monday. Next week, also, we have Hollywood's nanny to the stars. Marva is internationally known. Yes, she's got so many incredible stories. She takes care of a lot of the celebrities' children, babies, marvelous babies is her company. And she's got wonderful stories uh, as well. She's called upon in Hollywood as the nanny to the stars. She's going to be with us next week. Also coming up, Joel Thurm, who was going to be with us the other night, but he got called away. He was in Palm Springs. 
He's the legendary Hollywood casting director. He wrote this iconic book. He was, uh, you know, vice president of casting and talent for NBC. He he cast shows like The Facts of Life and The A Team and and Family Ties and just the Bob Newhart show. It goes on and on and on. Also, he worked on the Rocky Horror Picture Show and just. It's the Golden Girls. He cast the Golden Girls. I mean, it's amazing. His stories are amazing. He's got a new book out. He's going to be with us uh, coming up as well. That's on Saturday the 11th. So it's a week from this Saturday. He was going to be with us last night, I think it was. But he's, uh, again, he got called away. So we rescheduled. He's going to be with us coming. For those that are watching live, if you're watching this again a year from now, he will he will have already been on and you can binge watch the episode. But he is an icon in the industry and I cannot wait to chat with him. I just spoke to him on the phone today. Uh, he's in Los Angeles. Uh, he's originally from New York and he's all excited. He's going to be stopping by the gym master show as well. And so many more people working so hard behind the scenes. It's a lot of work hosting and producing and booking and all the stuff that we do, promoting all these shows, all this content for all of you that we've been doing. Uh, you would think we've got 700 people. This kind of show, the way we do it, you would think there would be a staff of 700 people doing all these different things and be very surprised that that is not the case. So, uh, you know, if you love it, give us a like. That helps us grow. Drop a comment on our YouTube channel underneath the episode. Subscribe to the YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. Click the red subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything. Spread the word. Share the links from our YouTube channel episodes right onto your social media. Interact with us. Uh, I'm at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Jim Masters TV. And let us know how much you enjoy all this content. And if you want, binge watch past episodes. There are almost a thousand available for you to watch. Could you imagine Imagine that? You know, uh, just kick back and go back in the archives and watch, see how our show has evolved, see how our show has grown in, in so many different levels, not just in different guests and different ways we do it, but even some of the presentation and the technical aspects. And we're always tweaking and working behind the scenes to give you the best that we can give you, only the best at JMS. It's a lot of expense, a lot of time, a lot of work, and juggling it with what I do professionally all day long in TV and radio gets a little crazy sometimes, but I love doing it for all of you. So if uh, you're enjoying it, what we do is unique here. We don't, just, we don't do like interviews. We do conversations, and we bring you guys in, and, uh, and I love any of that. So thanks for being with us, gang. I uh, really love having you here. It was really awesome having uh, the iconic Peter Bliss with us. So many great shows coming up for you. And thanks. And Mona, 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 I am still using your delicious spices that you sent me from Louisiana, from uh, New Orleans, the LSU spices and the rubs. We put them on meat. We put them in salads. I've put them in soups. We've put them on vegetables. Still, every time I have them, I think of Mona. Mona in Louisiana, one of our longtime lovities here on the show. Merlin also is here as well, except on karaoke night. <laughs> Maybe we'll have Merlin come on as a guest and she can sing for us. Are you very good at karaoke night, Merlin? Do you knock him dead after you have your bologna sandwich? <laughs> all right, gang, we love you all. If this was your first time watching, thanks for being with us. I'm your host, Jim Masters. Uh, this was one of our more extended episodes, but a really, really cool one. And uh, yes, we did get the new guitar. This here isn't the new guitar. I'll probably show that to you. Beautiful new guitar we just picked up. We were at the guitar store. Uh, actually going to get another one, a second one this weekend. Um, very excited about it. So we'll, we'll try to squeeze that in and show you guys the new guitars. But we love this one too. This was a gift actually. This was a gift from my brother-in-law, this particular one, because he's played guitar as well. Um, this was a gift. And so that's a family gift there. And uh, But... Yeah, we have a new one in the house and uh, in JMS Levity Hall, our studio here. And uh, yeah, good stuff. All right, I'm going to take off here because I literally have, believe it or not, a television shoot. I know tomorrow is Saturday morning and most people are off and relaxing, but I've got a television shoot 
uh, for the news magazine TV series that I host in New York with my co-host, Doug Llewellyn, who hosts the People's Court TV series. And I will be in the studio with a guest uh, on set filming, doing the news magazine show interview. And the guest is coming in from... I think the Midwest, right? Yeah, the Midwest, flying across the country to the East Coast, to the Northeast uh, for the uh, TV shoot tomorrow morning. So I got to be up really early. Wrote all the scripts, got everything together because that's more scripted, you know, and uh, got all the information and all kinds of stuff. And uh, she's amazing. She She's an animal healer and all kinds of cool stuff. So I can't wait to do that tomorrow morning. But we have our shows tomorrow night. And we have a show on Sunday for you. Saturday is 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Sunday, earlier show, 2 p.m. Eastern um, and 11 a.m. Pacific and 7 p.m. in Ireland. Ireland. Let me show you one more time uh, just to um, remind you for those that are watching live, you know, because we've got so much going on here. Uh, tomorrow, Laura Purcell is going to be here sharing a lot of great music as she celebrates her legendary father, composer, Bill Purcell, who passed recently with COVID. And she she's incredible. You know, she played Tanya Harding in the Word Al Yankovic movie. She played Tanya Harding because Laura is also a figure skater. Isn't that amazing? And Keith will be with us on um, Saturday. It's going to get you into the Irish spirit, the Irish mode with Keith on Sunday. Uh, also, real quick, I might as well throw this in, right? Uh, we also have coming up, if you love Broadway and you love theater and you love music, let me give you a little preview here. Stephen Suskin is coming on our show and he is a renowned American theater critic and historian of musical theater and author of an incredible new, incredible new book, The Great American Songbook, 201 favorite songs that you'll love. And he actually whittled down 201 of the most iconic songs from the Great American Songbook. And he has a new book out. And he is a renowned American theater critic, historian of musical theater, and author, author of 17 books dealing with theater and music and, and Broadway and the arts. He's going to be coming up on a upcoming episode of the Gym Masters show live series as well. So very exciting. Just a few of the people. And, and as I mentioned, if you watch our show and you watch all the episodes, every episode is different. We don't have just people from music or people from acting or people from sports or comedy or culinary or every show is something unique and different. And I love that variety. I, you know, sometimes I kick back and I binge some of these episodes when I have time and I'm like, oh yeah, that guest was on. And then it rolls over to the next episode that we did. And that guest was on and they have a whole different thing that they do in their life. And I think that's so cool that we have such a variety of topics, guests, entertainment, information for all of you, something for everybody, literally. And even if you're tuning in and maybe the guest wasn't what you were going to initially uh, tune in for if it was the guest. And then you end up watching, you you're like the vibe of what we do. You like the whole show and the format and just the feeling of our show. That's what's brought a lot of people in too, is just the fact that uh, they like what we're doing here at the Gym Master Show and, and the way it's done. And we respect you and appreciate all of you. So um kind of a cool thing we're doing here. And as long as you're here and you spread the word and more people watch and they view and they subscribe and they tell, we'll just keep growing together uh, and make Lovety Hall around the world bigger and bigger and bigger. All right. For those watching uh, the Gym Masters show live, thank you very much for watching us live. Those watching this in the archives 24-7, uh, morning, noon, and night, we thank you for joining us as well. We don't say goodbye around here. We say see you later. Ciao, cheers, shalom, slancha, uh, avida zain, hasta la vista, sayonara, moi loop. Take care, cheerio, be well, and uh, don't forget to uh, relax. Yes, don't forget to relax. Listen to some good music and chill out and relax, gang. Yeah, there you go. Everybody, I, actually, uh, in the beginning of our series, I used to show this a lot, and then 
just got so bogged down with everything that I didn't. And then everybody asked for this to be back. They love this sign so much. <laughs> there it is. So don't forget to relax. Take time. Uh, check out our shows. And we love you all. This is your host, Jim Masters, thanking you and you and you and you and everybody watching for spending time with us. Stopping by Liberty Hall at the Jim Masters Show Live Series. Uh, we will be back. I'll be right here waiting for you in this chair, the host chair. I might change my clothing, <laughs> style the hair different, and uh, but I'll be back. We'll see you on the next episode. All right. Take care. Class dismissed. Be well. We'll see you next time on the Gym Master Show Live. Take care and be well. Cheers. <laughs>